Uh, I mean, well, maybe I'll uh, I'll start. Um, I think for us, we were going to do this in kind of three parts, and uh, I'm going to turn it over to Sylvia for some of the um, background information on one of the chapters, and then to to Simon. So um, I think we can go ahead to the next slide. So here's what we're hoping for this evening. Um, uh, similar to our first meeting, maybe hoping for seven o'clock to nine o'clock. We usually find an hour and a half to two hours is, is a good time. Um, and then uh, what we hope to cover is you can see these eight things, but the project schedule, which those who are in the first of all uh, saw, but we want to go into a little bit uh, more in, in the sense of how to handle some um, online meetings. And then the draft plan sections, and we'll go into a little bit more uh, detail on chapter two. And then a little bit of a word on COVID-19 and, and some strategies there. Um, stakeholder engagement, which will include a community engagement update and the website. And then a word on objectives and strategies um, of the 2009 plan to test with the uh, with the committee. So, Hi, Frank. Sorry to cut you off real fast. Just oh, uh, a bit of um, Zoom etiquette. If you're not speaking, can you please mute your um, mute it? Thank you. Great. Right, right. And then next steps, we just want to uh, go over those, um, including a next committee meeting. So um, at any rate, comprehensive plan uh, steering committee members, I, I think most of the members Omar, Manny, uh, Jeff introduced themselves at the last meeting. I think there might be um, a new member or two and maybe they, they would want to introduce them themselves briefly. That, that would be Frank. Um, Frank, you want to introduce yourself? Right. Um, well, good evening. I'm Frank Budding. I am uh, a fairly new resident since last September. We came from New Rochelle. I see here on the panel Frank Fish. We met as well in New Rochelle. I'm the husband of Nina Aaron. Yes, great. Uh, and um, I am a consulting arborist, and I'm particularly involved with the management of urban trees. Um, my wife is an urban planner, and together. We uh, have a fair amount of uh, uh, urban interest between us and uh, are involved with urban planning. Great, including I know walking a lot. <laughs> yes, we do. I remember, yeah. So. We, uh, last year, we, uh, or two years ago, we walked the River Thames, uh, 200 miles in England from the source to the sea and um, also here in the local neighborhood this last weekend we did a walk of 12 miles a round walk of the briar Pl cliff uh, peak skill uh, trail to the croton falls and back via the aqueduct croton trail which is about 12 miles yeah. a good day's walk yeah. yeah is there anyone else who wasn't introduced at the last meeting or i think everybody I, okay. I don't think I was. Oh, okay. Jeff, Jeff, yeah. Uh, I'm uh, Ro Moran. Okay. Uh, hi, Ro. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure thing. Uh, my name is uh, Rodolfo Moran. I'm a, I'm a Austinian resident, Austinian village of uh, resident for about 11 years now, I think. Um, I uh, used to run uh, the, one of the non local nonprofits here, uh, Neighbors Link, uh, the, the community center that we have here. Uh, uh, but for about two months now, I've been uh, with another organization, but I was also part of the committee with Jeff and others on the uh, downtown redevelopment. Um, and. Um, that's basically it. Okay, all right, great. So any, anyone else that uh, hasn't, is new? Okay, I guess we, uh, we go on. We're, we're, the comprehensive plan um, 
sort of village staff that we're working with. I think everybody knows Karen, Jaime, uh, Jamie, uh, Maddie, and Stuart as Corporation Council. Um, uh, we, we sort of at BFJ introduced ourselves at the last meeting, but uh, very uh, um, briefly, I'm uh, Frank Fish and a principal of the firm. Um, the uh, associate principal and project manager here is, is Simon Cates. Jonathan, I think you're on, or is that right? Is our uh, senior associate in terms of design. Sylvia is our project planner and Christine is um, a planner working on this. Um, there's two groups working with us. Um, that's Urbanomics, who's um, uh, share space with us uh, when, we are <laughs> when we are in the office. Um, and they're an economic firm and also um, uh, do market analysis. And they do analysis uh, for school systems. And so they do a lot of uh, public school demographic uh, work. And I think that could be very valuable here, we hope. And then Kellard Sessions, I think you all know uh, Joe uh, Cermelli from Kellard Sessions. So he's your consulting village engineer and he'll, he'll be responsible for some of the infrastructure um, sections of this plan. So that's the uh, overall team. And then um, again, for those of you on the past, the, the startup session, this um, is probably familiar to you, but I thought we should go over it um, a little bit again, just to um, highlight some of the uh, key things here in those blue, um, the blue uh, sort of um, insignia there on the top is, um, we hope will be committee meetings. And um, I'm just gonna point out that we hope to have one, uh, which I think we set um, uh, last meeting, uh, May, May 19th. Um, so, those committee meetings, we hope, will go through the process of the plan, the drafting the plan. Um, toward the end of that process, um, state law says that during the development of the plan, the committee should hold a public hearing. So there's um, two um, uh, workshops here that we have. Um, uh, we've got in our contract sort of four workshop outreach meetings um, we hope in the spring, May, June, July, to do those on an interactive uh, process with a, a sort of a product called Social Pinpoint, which we'll discuss a little bit, Simon will discuss a little bit later. Uh, and then hopefully, if things, um, if things are better, which we hope they will be, uh, late summer, maybe early fall, to get into some uh, type of workshop uh, presentations and then hold that, um, the committee could hold its own hearing. Right after that, uh, the draft plan would be sent to, state law requires the committee to then send it to the trustees. And what we're very happy about, two trustees are on this um, uh, committee, and so it won't be, what we hope to do is keep the trustees um, involved all along. You can see trustee meetings in orange up there, or yellowish orange. Uh, so we hope to have meetings, a series of meetings with the trustees, because eventually as they get the plan, they're the ones responsible for implementing it with the zoning code update. Uh, and also they're responsible for um, sort of just uh, complying with the State Environmental Quality Review Act, which um, that's um, going through an environmental assessment form or that you can see in yellow there, EAF, um, if the trustees decide on that to make a positive declaration, which I think uh, it is quite possible, uh, I think that uh, those people we've talked to so far in our initial meetings with the trustees, it could very well then, if they do that, the positive declaration means, look, there are things here in the plan or the zone that may have some environmental impacts and we need to study them. And so you go to a draft generic environmental impact statement. So at some point over, it will be 2021, but hopefully in the, in the winter, you can see in there in February where we've got a public hearing listed, that the trustees would then be able to hold a, a hearing on the draft plan, uh, any draft zoning code updates, uh, and then the draft generic environmental impact statement. Now after that, then comes uh, 
we've got to do the make the revisions as a result of public comment, make the revisions on a final plan on any final zoning updates. And then we also have to do a final generic environmental impact statement answering the environmental questions raised at the public hearing. So that's the overall sort of um, process through sort of uh, late spring uh, 2021. Uh, all during that at the bottom here, we're hoping that public outreach will be continuous. Um, and we'll get in, Simon will get into that later in terms of the public survey, subcommittee uh, meetings, stakeholder meetings, and then online outreach and a website, which we'll, we'll talk about soon. So with that, maybe, um, Jaime, and we can go to the next uh, slide. And um, what we're gonna try to do at each meeting with you is um, different uh, people in our firm and, and including Simon and I, We'll be writing sort of drafts, just first, just data points. We've started to do that a little bit with um, what we call, and your current plan, the 2009 plan, calls the village and regional overview, which is why it's in green here. We'd like to spend a moment tonight just to highlight some demographic data that would be in that chapter. And then gradually, next meeting, give you that draft chapter. Um, and then go into land use and zoning, some basic uh, information, some of which, a lot of which you may already know, but trying to bring out the issues of that and go through each chapter consecutively uh, that way until we get to the 10th chapter, which is really going to be really interactive on your part and then the trustees part, because that's um, an action agenda and implementation uh, of the plan. So. Those are the sort of 10 chapters uh, of the plan uh, right now. Two of them, um, eight of them are similar to what's in your 2009 plan. There's two that are new, um, that land use and zoning chapter is new and this because we've been, just from our very first interview with the trustees, uh, zoning uh, uh, became, it was clear to us, is an important issue and we thought that ought to have its own chapter, land use and zoning. and then. The current 2009 plan didn't seem to have a, a uh, very good plan, we think, but it didn't seem to have a wrap up chapter that really had an action uh, agenda to it. So we've got a 10th chapter in this. So um, with that, maybe I can um, just uh, uh, highlight this um, chapter two, if you will, the village and regional overview, and I'm gonna turn it to Sylvie in a moment, but. It'll have some sections, which the current 2009 plan has. Um, I think regional uh, context is, is very important. There's some decisions in Westchester, like the Berenson decision in Newcastle about regional responsibilities of different municipalities, but also in terms of the region, uh, there's the Westchester 2025. What are the other plans surrounding you and that affect you? And then local and uh, sort of the plant local context, planning context that you've done a lot of work already. You've got uh, Kevin Dworka's uh, work that's been done on housing. So we'll try to bring a lot of that to bear and also give a snapshot of the village if we could on social demographic characteristics. So on that, I'd like to just turn this to Sylvia um, and just to spend a, a few moments on a couple of slides on the demographic characteristics. Thank you, Frank. Uh, so this is just uh, some, as uh, Frank mentioned, some dot points uh, regarding the social demographics. We are obviously going uh, much deeper in our um, in the writing of the chapter that we uh, we are hoping to um, to give you a draft, a full draft, uh, including the history and regional and local context next month. Uh, so I'm just going to point out some of the data that we've been pulling from the census and uh, just a couple of uh, uh, things on methodology uh, the 2000 and 2010 uh, data that you will see uh, there uh, from the decennial census uh, and the 2018 is from the american community survey which has a, uh, a smaller sample is still um, you know fairly accurate but obviously 
we are waiting on the 2020 um, new census that we, we won't have those data uh, ready just yet. <laughs> Uh, so we are relying on these uh, three years to just understand the changes in the community. Um, starting with population, uh, as you can see from the chart on the right, uh, the 2000 uh, population, since 2000, population has dropped in the village. And we can say that between 2010, 2018 has been uh, stable or slightly increasing. Uh, but really the trend that it's been um, ongoing um, at the country level is that the, the birth rates are down. Uh, so in 2018 uh, was the year that it was the lowest ever recorded in number of births. Um, and you know it's a trend that uh, it's not uh, it's not just New York State. Uh, it's been uh, going on, and we expect uh, it will stay like this or even declining more in the future. So if you can go to the next one, um, if I can, I just want to jump in real fast and let everybody know uh, I've added Sheila Vereen uh, Massengale. She is a she's called in, um, so she's she's a, a phone in participant, but she's one of the board members. Sorry about Hi. that. Hi. Hello. Hello. Hi. How are you doing? Hey, Sheila. How are you? How's everyone? Very good. good. Thanks for joining. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm just listening. I'm here. Right. <laughs> Great. Um, so just to go to really quick to the race and ethnicity composition. Uh, as you all know, uh, Austin has always been a very diverse uh, place and especially compared to Westchester County. And uh, uh, as you can see the composition in 2018 in the chart uh, to the right, 46.7% um, um, of the people of the residents identify as a Hispanic or Latino and 12.4% uh, uh, as a black or African American. And this has been stable um, in the last 10 years, whereas the Hispanic or Latino um, group uh, is been growing. Uh, and in 2000, this uh, percentage was uh, um, almost 28%, and now it's you know almost 47%. Um, you can go to the next one. So in terms of age, uh, obviously we are, there are more, uh, there's more than one group, uh, but here is just a snapshot of the younger population, um, just under 18 years old group. And uh, the village uh, population is, um, the, the, let's say the village, the group of people under 18, is being going up uh, in the village, and whereas it's going down in, at the county level. Um, so there is this, you know, difference between the village and the county. I can go to the next. Thanks. Um, this is pretty interesting. And uh, uh, in 2018, uh, the village has uh, at 38.4 percent of foreign-born population, um, and the it was already 30% in 2000, uh, but it's, gone, it's going up. And this is the same trend that the, the Westchester County is experiencing, uh, but uh, obviously, as you can see, it's, uh, it's just 25.6%, uh, whereas the village is more than 38. Um, and here in this chart, we also compare the town of Austin, which is the unincorporated uh, parts of the, uh, of the town of Austin. And um, as you can see, it's very different. Um, only 16% in 2018 um, uh, were foreign born population. Uh, getting more into jobs and unemployment rate. Uh, so this is um, a good uh, sign that uh, the village has a very pretty low uh, unemployment rate in 2018. Um, maybe the numbers are a little small, but it's a 4.3% in 2018. And this is very much aligned with the US um, levels. Um, but uh, obviously the 2010 uh, data reflect what possibly was the uh, 
you know, post recession um, numbers uh, where, you know, 8% of the population was unemployed. And, uh, but, you know, it's a good sign that since from this data, at least, since that the population of the village has uh, recovered from the recession. If we go to the next one, though, uh, you know, the data is, uh, is not as uh, clear as a pattern now because we see that, uh, contrary to what I just said, that, you know, the population seems to be uh, recovering from the 2010 recession, the income level is not, is just not as high as it has been in the past. Um, so in 2018, um, the median household income, uh, which is adjusted for inflation, uh, so we can compare the, the numbers, uh, it was uh, over 72,000, uh, but in 2010 it was much higher. So, you know, when we get those uh, data, when we pull those data from the census, uh, there is an analysis that we have to do um, in terms of understanding the trends that uh, have been uh, going on. And this is a clear case in which we need to uh, dig uh, deeper and understand why uh, the income levels are not as good, uh, whereas the unemployment rate uh, seems pretty good. So I will leave it like that. Um, I think I will- Sylvia, so, yeah, can I add, I wanna add one thing to the yeah. slide, uh, just for context, which is that um, this, this decline uh, from, from both 2000 and 2010 to 2018 uh, we found is, is common among the village centers in Westchester County. It's not necessarily uh, a pattern that you see countywide, but we've seen it in other villages. Um, I, I don't know that we, we know enough to, to do more than hypothesize about why this is, um, but it's something that's not only affecting um, Austin. So I, I just wanted to point that out. It's not a, it doesn't seem like a blip. I don't think that it's wrong data. Um, it's, it's something that we've seen in other uh, in other village centers, um, uh, in other parts of the county as well. Yeah, and, uh, Simon, I'll just add to that because we need to look at, we will be looking at in the chapter, uh, where people work. And it may be, we might find, uh, as we have in some other uh, villages and locations, and Jaime, we found this in Mount Vernon too a little bit, uh, and that is, um, there may be a significant part of the workforce that is in the service industry. and. Uh, in terms of services workforce, um, when, when you uh, adjust for inflation, uh, those wages really haven't gone up. Gone up. Uh, so we'd ha we'll have to look at that and uh, look at the industries that people are working in, where they're working. Uh, and if they're heavily in the service industry, uh, that's a place that wages have not significantly gone up. So we'll have to see. Yeah more to come <laughs> yeah we will have a full draft uh at the next meeting so stay tuned yeah. excuse me i have a question yep uh this is ro um and my question is um so how do you guys account for i guess uh you know uh the huge undocumented population that we might have that uh definitely weren't counted in the last census uh, that, you know, don't have an income. It's kind of like, you know, day laborers and stuff like that, which is a huge part of our population. And even not, not your typical household here, right? You know, it, when, it, when- Actually, uh, we found this in, in other uh, places. We had uh, an issue. Oh, sorry. Go on. Go ahead, Frank. Frank, are you there? I think his signal is frozen for just a sec. He'll catch oh, up, yeah, I'm he, sure. Yeah, he's, he's deep in thought. That or he's really thinking hard. Yeah, <laughs> deep, deep, deep in thought. I mean, you can see it on his face. Let's... Maybe if uh, if we're waiting for Frank. Ro, you were sort of in the middle of a uh, a point. Could you make that? And then maybe Frank will come back. Well, yeah, it's and it's um, we, we. I think that we are are the demographic in this population, uh, in this village is is 
is unique a little bit just because we do have uh, a huge undocumented population, not your typical households when it comes to like one family living in an apartment, um, foreign born, uh, not having documentation, being not having filled out the census, um, et cetera. So how do we account to that when it comes to this uh, village overview? Yeah, I wanted to just mention some other places we've worked or are working now also do share that a little bit. Uh, there are places like Yonkers, Mount Vernon, New Rochelle, Port Chester, and recently we just finished a plan in Mount Kisco where some of these same issues um, came to the fore. And we are somewhat, uh, I think there are ways to I, hopefully to get at it, but I want to start with the limitation and that is uh, the census data itself is the data that's going to provide a continuity uh, over time. And as you know, I, I don't know if the county has made um, presentations to your board of trustees. They've tried very hard to, of course, publicize the um, census, but not everyone is going to take it. You're going to probably have um, a higher percentage uh, because of the what you've just mentioned of uh, undocumented people not feeling comfortable uh, taking it. So you're going to have the risk of underrepresentation um, as these other cities and some villages have had in Westchester. Um, we're going to try an outreach to uh, get uh, people that may be underrepresented in terms of meetings also, as well as being counted, uh, to get them involved in this in this process. But there is not a silver bullet here, I don't think. And, and, and uh, um, others may want to comment on this. It's not easy to uh, get a sense of this uh, without going uh, to things that could be, um, you know, counts that we may uh, get from utility companies, for instance. That's a, you know, a possibility that I've seen done. And also from the school district. And we'll be meeting with the school district um, and they, they will be looking at the uh, demographic that they have and their grade by grade projections. Usually the school district, you know, is going to account for most of those uh, students uh, uh, because I think, you know, that's a, sometimes a better source. So we'll, we'll look at different sources, but we will be, uh, the census is not going to pick up uh, everybody and it's a particular uh, issue, I think, for maybe a half dozen communities in Westchester. Thank you. Right. Um, if I could, you know, kind of sort of piggyback a little bit on that to, to try to see if I can get some clarity. Um, I know that, Ro, you mentioned this as, a, as an area of concern because the demographic data that we're using doesn't really have that information. Could you maybe try to tie it a little bit to us as it relates to the comprehensive plan and things that you're concerned about picking up in the comp plan, acknowledging that that data is, is insufficient to, to give the whole picture? I, I think I think it just doesn't I don't believe it paints a completely honest picture because I do feel that uh, we have so many families that are unaccounted and everything uh, that you know they don't even make close to that what is it seventy two thousand uh, thing and I think that there um, you know we we if you for example once once you talk to the school district you'll find that we have uh, I don't know I think it's something over 50 percent free lunch and and uh, uh, and, and, and breakfast etc uh, so we are in, in that way we are we're, we're a family that doesn't have uh, we're What's, what's the word? We're just not a, a very uh, rich community uh, in any way. And, and I think that that, that needs to be um, reflected in, in what we do, because I do believe that that affects uh, our capabilities. Right, okay. So yeah, there's I can jump in here. Can I, can I jump oh, in? Go ahead. Yeah, um, so uh, thanks for bringing up this point, Ro. Uh, I think one, piece of information that would be helpful in framing this conversation is what the purpose of showing us the this data is. If it's just FYI, here's what your village looks like according to the data. What do you think? What's your reaction? Or if there's some other purpose, because that can help to bridge the gap between 
what we know and what we know we don't know to get to where it is that we're trying to go. That's number one. And number two uh, is uh, I'm just grateful to see you all. I know we just kind of jumped right into it, but like, it's good to see you all. So, okay, go ahead. Number one. Hello, Omar. Yeah. Could, could I just add something to this? There, there's one chart here, the, the population chart. Uh, and I know there doesn't seem to be like a, a Y axis or whatever, but um, it's showing from 2000 to 2018. Uh, I think it was one of the first slides you showed uh, sort of a, um, a general trending down of population. And I just have to say, and, and maybe this is like, um, you know, supportive of what Roe was getting at, but that this do doesn't seem to like pass the smell test to me. And I'm generally like, you know, a uh, very, um, you know, data driven person. And just, you know, when you look at um, kind of the burden on, uh, you know, um, the pressures right now, and just for instance, like housing, I know the county did a housing needs assessment and under their definition, they said the village was about 2,200 units short of, um, you know, having sufficient housing for like the demand that we have in our, in our village. And, um, it, you know, when you talk about like the growth in the school district and things like that, like some of that could be driven by demographic changes, like, you know, uh, maybe an aging population moving out and younger families moving in or whatever. But um, just in terms of like, if this is going to become, and as Omar said, what's the purpose of this? If this is going to become the foundation for decision making about what kind of need we have in our community, um, maybe if there's other metrics we can look at besides the census um to kind of capture like a a broad you know just get a different picture of what the reality is in our village yeah jeff it's a good point and uh, uh, uh that's one of the things that tina lund who i mentioned uh with urbanomics is going to do also with the school district district because um uh, and, and and answer a little bit to omar's question that uh the purpose of this is kind of not not just one item but it's a couple of items one is you know what, it's a snapshot in a way, and we'll try to get it as accurate as we can uh, so that we, we give people a snapshot of the village, what is happening like uh, today, because it's, it's best, I find, to make decisions or for the committee to look at issues within the context of is the best data set we can get. And that's, so it's, it's twofold really to show that data and then to in discussions in public outreach with the stakeholders with you the committee to come up with what the issues are that 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 data is sort of informing so that um i i think one thing that um the manager mentioned in an early meeting was you want to have uh, the issues framed in such a way that they're based on solid data and the the data will never be perfect it's not going to be perfect but we want to get it as accurately as we can. And we'll be getting the school districts grade by grade projections. And, and Jeff, there's a lot of um, uh, information out there. We've got the county's information on their, you know, their shortage in housing, but again, you, and we'll go over that in housing chapter and how they calculated that. However, Westchester itself, you wanna see it in a larger context and we'll try to provide that context a little bit. I, I'm finding in some other communities that we're working, um, Jaime knows Mount Vernon very well. I've been a resident there for a long time. And people think the school district, for instance, in Mount Vernon because of immigration and uh, because of some of these same issues is overcrowded, overburdened. It's not overcrowded. In fact, it's got, a, uh, it's got significant capacity in it. I'm not saying that about Ossining. But we want to look at all the data and uh, get a, a factual basis to then to then discuss these issues. So we're not saying what the issues will come out of this necessarily. Same way with the other chapters. We'd like to do that with transportation and parking. Parking has been identified as a big issue. We'd like to get data that, you know, sort of encapsulates it. So it just informs the discussion for you, the committee. committee. That's what we're trying to do. All right. I, I'd like to make a um, I'd like to make a recommendation, and if the uh, if the steering committee is 
comfortable with this and if, if uh, BFJ, if y'all are comfortable with this. Um, I'm wondering if it makes sense to add, just as you're developing the chapter itself and writing the text, just make sure that you add some sort of reference to some of the, you know, significant literature that's out there that talks about the undercounting that takes place in minority communities. And yes. reference, reference the fact that um, it's an acknowledged problem on a national level that there's significant undercounting going on in minority communities. So these numbers, although they've decreased over the last um, 20 years slightly, that may not be an accurate reflection of what the real numbers are. And just use it as maybe a break point to, to, to provide context to the disparity in the information that you're seeing, presuming that you are going to see some different information in the, um, the school district numbers if, if what everybody presumes is the case is leading up. Again, I do know what you're talking about in Mount Vernon. Mount Vernon is, is another place where they think that it's overcrowded. And I, I think there is some misplacement in that instance where it's a, it's a discussion of there's too many students per teacher, um, which they think means that schools are overcrowded. And really, it, it, it's not that the schools themselves are overcrowded, but maybe the classrooms mm -hmm. don't have enough teachers. And that's a yeah. different issue. So, I mean, we'll, we'll do that. And thank you for bringing that well, I, I made it as a recommendation, but we really should ask the Siri committee how they feel about that. I, I don't, I don't want to lead the lead this. So that that's why I asked the steering committee, since everybody's sitting here, what their thoughts are on that approach. I think that's great. I would just also add for slides like this would be helpful to have the source, uh, just so I have yes. a sense of or sources, so I have a sense of where you're getting your numbers. Yeah, all of this, almost, not all of it, but almost all, is the census data right now. And we want to supplement that by meeting with the school district and others. Great. Um, what I, I, I want to add one last quick thought and answer uh, to your, um, your, your question or comment, Omar, which is that the, one of the major reasons that we wanted to go through this, and we'll go through a similar s sequence of you know, what we've learned so far, either from looking at data or from talking to others in the community, is to get your take on it. It's, it's this exact conversation, right? Here's what we've learned so far. What are we missing? Are we on the right track? Do we need to talk about some of the details? So this, this sort of brief conversation right here is exactly what we want to try to do yeah. a, a month, month as we're going through uh, the chapters. And, and Omar, I would add to the other thing is what Jaime just mentioned, which I'm glad he did. Um, what are the issues coming out of some of this? Each, each chapter is appropriate we want to end a little bit with or identify what are some of the issues. Well, undercounting in the minority community, that's an issue. And I think we ought to address it in this, you know, in this chapter. And likewise in other chapters, if there's other issues with infrastructure or transportation or the housing chapter, which will be an important chapter, and the community facilities, um, particularly the schools, we'll try to identify after you've seen the data and discussions with you all identify those issues in each chapter. One, and, and I recognize my airtime here, so I'll be quiet for a long time after this. But one <laughs> uh, a very small, but to me important point would be, uh, instead of using the term minority, using the term people of color, uh, not only because of the inaccuracy in Austin, there are more people of color than white people. So being accurate and in the world, there are more people of color than white people. So. Uh, minority uh, is a, could be a, a problematic term. I, I would just uh, posit people of color as one that gets the same point across, but it doesn't have the same kind of uh, uh, intonations. Right, right, very good. Okay, Simon, we'll turn it to you. Great, thank you. Um, so the next item on the agenda is to talk a little bit about you know, where we are in this, in this time and, and what, it, what it is going to be like to plan now. And there's two sides of this. Um, the first one is what this means for the process, and that's what this slide is about. And the second one on the next slide is about what are the issues that are going to come out of planning in this, in this era. And so let me talk about this one first. Um, what, are, what are we doing in, in the short term and what are some of the tools that we're going to be developing over the course of the, of the coming months um, to make sure that we can conduct a comprehensive uh, a plan update process that, um, that has robust community engagement that is inclusive. Um, that's, that's critical for us. We can't do this as your consultant. 
um, the, the steering committee um, would, would, be, uh, would, be, would be hindered if we weren't hearing from others in the community as well. So um, this is something that we wanna keep talking about and make sure that, um, that if, if you all see that we're not doing enough or we're not on the, on the wrong track, um, give us feedback and make sure that we are, um, we're doing the right things to hear from the community. Um, so to go through the items that we've got on here, um, we've, we've got a draft of the website that, that I'll, I'll sort of preview for, for you all um, in, a, in, a, in a couple of minutes. Um, the website itself is, is, you know, it's relatively static. It's going to have a, it's sort of a clearinghouse for information, a background of the project, but it's going to be a place where we can house a more, a more interactive um, opportunities for people to, uh, uh, to participate. So it's, it's, it's going to be a, a, um, a good place for people to go. Um, um, to learn more about the plan as, as we go along. Um, there are going to be a series of different types of surveys that we can do um, online. Uh, now, typically, we would have a survey online, and we would provide hard copies, paper copies for people in the community. Um, you know, is there going to be a way to do that for a sub more substantial survey um, in, in a couple of months? We'll, we'll, we'll think about that. But in the short term, um, we've got a, we've, we've got this idea for a survey about the name of the plan. Um, we'll talk about some specific um, potential names in a couple of minutes. Um, but once we get all of you to, to narrow in on maybe three or four um, sort of favored uh, options, um, our thought was to go out to the community with a survey. Um, it'll be a quick one. We'll, we'll do some social media outreach. We'll, um, we'll ask all of you to help us um, get the word out, but we want to hear from the community um, what is a what is a name of this uh, of this plan and of this process that reflects your vision for what uh, you want the plan to do? Um, the next two items here um, are, are are tools using a platform um, that we've started working with called Social Pinpoint. They are online interactive um, uh, tools. The first one, the Ideas Board, I'm gonna I'm gonna preview with a brief uh, video in a couple of minutes. Um, I, we talked about both of these a little bit last month, but the ideas board is like a sticky board. Um, it's like at a public workshop, you've got a post-it note, you write your idea down, you put it on the, on the poster. Um, it's a great tool for visioning. We're early in the process. We want to ask people, um, what are your high level conceptual um, sort of vision, visionary ideas for, for what this plan ought to be about? Uh, the second item, the interactive map, we think we would roll out a little bit later with a focus more on issues and opportunities. It's getting into some of the details. What are some of the challenges that we need to, uh, that we need to um, respond to? But the key here is that we could have the greatest online outreach tools in the world, but if we are not connected to the right people in the community or as many people in the community as we can be, um, then we're not gonna get a lot of information, right? Um, it's the same as if you've got a public workshop and you don't get the word out and, and only 15 people show up. And it's the same 15 people that show up to every workshop, right? Um, you might get a lot of enthusiastic input, but it's not going to be representative. It's not going to be inclusive. So um, one of the keys here is that we need to work through all of you and through different community organizations to get the word out. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later as well when we get into uh, discussion about, about the subcommittees. Um, but... Um, you know, this is just to say, you know, we've, we're going to have to do some outreach online so that we can, um, you know, start this process off, but it's not just us as the consultant meeting with all of you um, once a month and nobody else is, is providing feedback. So we need to make sure that there are tools that are online and that we're getting the word out. Um, the next item here is, um, it's an answer to the question of why even do this now? Right? Why not wait until this all blows over? And um, that's, that's a reasonable view. Um, we think that there's a stronger argument to, to, to keep going. And the reason is that um, we need to prepare for, and the village of Austin needs to prepare for, what are the changes that are gonna come out of this? And uh, I think the big picture is that a lot of the changes that we're gonna see uh, that come out of this, this COVID-19 era it, it, are an acceleration of trends that were already underway that people had already talked about, that people had already written about, that may have happened in five years or may not have happened for another 20 years, right? It's things like um, the impacts of online retail on Main Street businesses. Well, that was already happening, right? But it's now accelerated, right? Amazon's doing fine. Main Street businesses are, are shuttered for the time being, right? So how do we plan for 
um, those businesses coming back. This is the time to do it now, not waiting until um, you know, eight, 12 months, um, and, then, and then trying to come up with ideas for how businesses can, uh, can reemerge. Um, shift toward flexible work, co-working and working from home. That's one of those trends that people have been talking about for a while. Was that going to become the new normal in the, in the shorter, medium term? Um, you could argue probably, maybe not, right, without, without this. But now this is going to change that a little bit. So we need to start thinking about what's the impact going to be on Austin's downtown, on the neighborhoods, um, on, on mass transit, right, um, on traffic, when more people are, are choosing, um, look, I did it for four months, it worked out, now I'm going to keep doing this uh, going forward. Um, expansion of delivery services, what's going to be the impact on, on traffic and parking and so on. Um, the focus on public health and planning is a trend that's been, um, it's been in uh, sort of in the, in, in the literature about comprehensive planning. We think we're going to hear more about that um, in, in this planning process than we may have otherwise. Um, and, and the last item here is, is maybe more pressing. It's that there's going to be funds out there. And we don't think that the village wants to wait until, um, you know, uh, 12 or 18 months from now to start thinking about um, how do we need to um, allocate funds that, that, that the village can receive and that businesses can receive um, from the state and federal government um, to start, you know, to start identifying ways that we need to bounce back. This is the time to start thinking about it. Um, we, we, we think that there's a case that, um, a strong case that this has to happen now, even though it's different, right? We're not sitting around a table face to face. Um, we are gonna, we're gonna be flexible in, in the next few months and make sure we can hear from people online. Um, but there's a, there's a good reason to proceed with this um, uh, now to make sure that the village is in a good place to, um, to, to emerge, um, you know, when, when the time is right. Um, any any um, thoughts, questions on these on these two uh, these two sort of um, categories of of the COVID response? Okay. Um, Sheila, you are unmuted at this moment. Did you have any comments you wanted to make? No, I'm I'm just I'm just going along with what you're saying. I'm just listening. I have nothing to say right now. Okay. Um, so the next item here, um, we, we sent this around um, earlier today, and I'm sorry I didn't send this um, sooner, but um, one of the most important things, as I said in my email, that we want to come out of this uh, meeting tonight with is um, some direction on, on these subcommittees. Um, as, a, as, a, as a reminder, we talked about this a little bit last month. Um, these subcommittees are um, groups of different community organizations, community leaders, um, generally organized around the, the chapters of the plan, although there's a couple of, although there's a couple of variations from that. Um, and um, they serve two critical purposes for us. Um, number one is that they are the topic area experts that are going to give us that initial guidance on um, what are the key um, uh, sort of issue areas within each, uh, within each of these um, topics. Um, our, our, our sense of the process here is that we can have a meeting um, remotely, of course, uh, with each of these subcommittees. Um, we, based on those meetings, we'll develop a draft of a chapter. Um, we'll share the draft of the chapter with, with Jaime and Karen. We'll share it with all of you. And we'll also share it with the subcommittee um, so that they can give us more feedback. Hey, um, you know, did we interpret this right? Did we, get, did we get this right? Did we miss something from our meeting? Um, so that we, we have two different uh, um, sort of touch points with them to make sure that uh, uh, we're on the right track. Um, the list on the right side here is the, the different groupings of these subcommittees. And what we wanted to do tonight is go through each of these um, on, the, on the next sequence of slides. And we've got um, uh, a list that, uh, that Karen and Jaime helped develop for, uh, for each of these areas um, of the different organizations. Um, the spreadsheet that we sent to all of you um, earlier today has another level of detail of the individual names. Um, if you've got feedback on specific individuals that you think we should talk to within those groups, um, we can talk about it tonight or you could, or you could send those over email. Um, the key thing is, um, is what are the organizations that we need to be uh, reaching out to so that we make sure that we're not missing anything. Um, but the other thing, so that, the one point is that it's, it's, it's getting to talk to these topic area experts. But the other, which circles back to the last sequence of slides, is that the subcommittees are another way that we can reach out into the community. It's another group of all these different community organizations, individuals, community leaders, that we can say, hey, look, there's this 
great tool online. Um, how do we get it out to your networks, to your constituents, to, to people that you know in the community to make sure that uh, we're, we're reaching as many people as we can? Um, so they're, they're going to be critical for us, both in, in terms of learning about the issues, but also um, helping us reach out into the, um, into the community. Um, any, any questions on the role of the subcommittees before we start going through these? We're, our thought was to go sort of slide by slide. Uh, we've got one slide for each of these different um, topic areas on the right here. I, I, I do, thank you. I do have a quick question in regards to the subcommittee. So we, we kind of briefly touched that last time that we met uh, and my question was then, and I don't think was, um, because we can talk about it with more details. How many members would have been part of a subcommittee? What uh, what how the communities have done it uh, in, in that way, and what do you think we should be doing into here? Because I'm looking at the list, the spreadsheet that it was sent out early today. Um, and there's a pretty big list. Um, so yeah, the the ideal would be you know if if you think about it in terms of um, if we were doing these meetings in per in person, they'd be like a um, like a focus group meeting. You'd be sitting around a conference table, and eight to twelve people is a good number to, for that kind of a meeting. Um, we are going to be doing these meetings if if they happen in the in the next couple of months, which we hope they do remotely, um, like we're all talking right now. Um, it's it's probably going to work with about the same number of people. 8 to 12. If it's a little more, that's fine. If it's a little bit less, that's fine too. If, if some people aren't, aren't, um, aren't interested in participating, but that's, you know, there's a, there is a little bit of a sweet spot. If we have 50 people on a zoom call, it's going to be hard to have a conversation. Sure. My, I guess <clears throat> more in a specific question will be, so I, I know we're going to be just as an example, let's say the chamber of Congress. So a chamber will be a representative from the chamber. And so each group will be maybe one or two people, but part of the subcommittee coming from us, how many representatives from us we should be looking to engage? Is it going to be one or two? And then the two, the two people that is part of the subcommittee will engage to this, uh, to these groups. Is that the idea? Do you mean how many, how many discuss, committee members are? So, yeah. Are, are I you think committed? what, if I could ask Manny, do you mean that your committee, committee, the comprehensive plan committee, how many members will attend each subcommittee? No, real, well, the okay. idea was, my recollection, and probably Omar, you can, you can help me with this one. The, the idea was, my understanding from last year was having obviously this committee and from here, we'll engage other members that wanted to be part of this group so they can become part of the subcommittee and then they'll engage all these groups uh, on the community as a whole. That was so, my recollection from the yeah, yeah, Manny? That's what it was. Yes. Um, I went, um, you know, I helped uh, put together because I probably had more background on who the, the, the you know, subcommittee members would be. So um, this was based, like, really taken right out of the PACE study of what they recommended. So these were all lists that they had already gotten when we did the initial uh, uh, community engagement. So the, the task for the committee right now is to really go through this list, add their suggestions, or make, you know, if there's anything missing, um, and any contacts that you might know to bring to this party. Um, so that's where the, the, the steering committee has the ability to shape these subcommittees. Okay. So, but we, so... In, in regards to the subcommittees, when we start engaging other members in the community, for example, let's say we had, I, I know we had a pretty big list last year that they wanted to be part of this process, and we had only an X amount of seats available. So there's, there's still a pretty big list left, so we can engage those members to become part of, you know, the school engagement portion, the economic part of this, the parking part of this, you know, the housing. So that was the concept. So that's still, that is, is that still the concept now, Karen? Um, it's, it hasn't really changed. So I went through the list. Now there's two separate lists. There's people who wanted to be on the comprehensive plan committee. And then there's people who we went through to, that would shape subcommittees. So to be on a subcommittee, it's important that you have some affinity with whatever 
you are talking about. That doesn't mean we can't also cross pollinate with people who had wanted to get involved who have experience. Like there are people who wanted to get involved that maybe have planning and zoning experience or you know, maybe they're a store owner so that that parking would be relevant. So we can um, uh, call through that list too. Um, we also have, in, in addition to, you know, we have Frank thankfully joining us tonight, but we have one more uh, position on the committee to fill um, right now as well. Right. So um, we have been looking through this list and some of those people have already taken positions on uh, land use boards, things like that. Um, but there were sort of two, two tracks. One was identifying, you know, there are certain people who need to be involved, whether it's, you know, chamber, business people, banks for economic development. But I think that we can also take a close look at the, the, the other list and see where people might fit in as, as well to supplement. Okay, so we have to kind of look at, we need to kind of look back to what we have to try to engage other people that, you know, that, that, that would like to be part of this. And then we can start shaping the amount of people who will be in the subcommittee to look at a specific topics. Yes? Um, I would, what I suggest, because I think we need to go through, I think the people that have identified need to be on these subcommittees. Those are that, those groups we are already identified as those groups need to be part of the subcommittee and part of the process. Um, then what we can do is the, the list of people who applied isn't really a list that the whole committee had. That was a list that, that the trustees had or the mayor had. So we can also look through that list, um, and cross pollinate, um, where those people are appropriate. But, um, I don't know that, that, you know, again, what was identified in the PACE study was um, these are the groups that need to, you know, that, that represent the different constituencies that would then help inform the subcommittees. Um, through those people, there may be other people that they can bring to the table to provide a deeper reach into those subtopics. Okay. So when we'll be able to have this done? Um, well, um, one of the things like tonight, you know, if, if um, you know, if you approve the subcommittee, um, sort of the subcommittee categories and, and the, um, you know, sort of the initial list, if there's any other information that we can have tonight from you guys to flesh this out or within the next, you know, within the next couple of days, if we don't get to all of it tonight, then what we would do is we would um, then send out letters to engage those people to form the subcommittees. And what, what Manny, we can do is um, go over the list that um, uh, was where people submitted applications and make sure we're drawing from that as well for people. Okay, all right, fair enough, thank you. Okay. Yeah, I'm just, you know, it's, it, might, it might take a little bit of time to sort of tighten all that up, but I, but I would say the sooner that we can, we can start moving on these, the better, because um, there are a couple of steps, as, as Karen just laid out, that, that we need to go through to make sure that this is right. But if we can start meeting with some of these uh, these groups in 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 May, um, that's that's going to be a great help to us in in starting to formulate some of these some of these chapters. We need we need this input in order to uh, in order to move some of our ideas forward. So um, I guess Manny, in answer to your question, the sooner the better. But we need to we want to make sure that we've got the right we've got the right list. What I what I would request, if possible, if if the the group, because um, I know you just got this list today and it's a lot to sift through. I'm sure you're busy during the day, but if by um, the end of the week um, you can get us um, um, your, you know, any organizations, I mean, certainly tonight you can suggest it too, but by the end of the week, uh, give it some thought, any suggestions of, uh, either organizations, entities, individuals, um, or things that, that you feel might be missing that, that we can bring to the table here, then we can shape it out. Then what we'll do is, um, develop a, a sort of final list and then start outreach to people in that to see who actually wants to participate and shape it from there. And I think that would put us in a, in a pretty good spot to start by, you know, early mid May. Uh, yeah. And I think that one thing that's kind of important to note is that, uh, you know, Karen put a really great list together, but it doesn't mean that people who are not on that list don't have the opportunity to provide comments and feedbacks and, and things like that. So um, not having it, if there are more people that you want to add, I don't think that we want to, let too much time pass between um, the, the, the process of setting these meetings up uh, just because there's a lot of information to get. We can still, if somebody says, you know, hey, we overlooked this group, we can still set up conversations to get their input down the road. It doesn't mean that 
because they weren't a part of these stakeholder meetings, the official ones, that they're not going to get the opportunity to provide input. So, yep. so um, let's let's go through these. As Karen said, we might. Um, uh, uh, Karen, Karen, you're on mute. Uh, wait. Um, I just want to say again, the list I put together fell out of the um, community engagement that was done around the PACE study. So it really just played off that. Hmm. Okay, so we've got, um, and I, you know, I think the way to do this, rather than having me read each of these, is, is um, I might leave each of these up for, for a couple of moments, and if anyone... Um, you know, if anyone looks at these and sees that we're missing something or, or if it looks good, give a thumbs up or, um, you know, so here's, here's the list of the, the schools group. Any, any comments or thoughts here? St. Anne, um, St. Anne's uh, Catholic school is not on there. Oh, that's other a good comment. That's not a, that's not there's a no more school. school. Not there's a school, no school there anymore. Oh, got it. It's All just right. empty. Well, there yeah. you go. That's why it's not there. Got it. Okay. <laughs> Carry on. Okay. Anything else on the, on the schools? Yeah, we, we're missing um, St. Augustine's. We talked about St. Augustine's. That's, I mean, it's in the town, technically. Okay. Well, yeah, you're right. But is it? I, I know. Okay. I guess. Okay. I mean, there, I mean, the other thing is kids from the village probably go there. So, I, you know, I, it, it's, we may be splitting hairs, but we were being... I, I guess a little bit literal on this list. Yeah, I, I, I think mean, that I think the purpose of for the for the purpose of the comprehensive plan, it's really very important to to know what the impact of the plan is going to have on public action, right? And so, if we're setting policy, um, we need to know what's going on in the public schools more than we need to know what's going on in a private school that's not in the village confines. If that makes any sense. And so, because we are sort of geographically small, the relevant information we're getting from the public schools is, is significant, and the, 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 the relevant information we're going to get from a private school, um, even if it was in town, may not be as useful towards the development of policy. Well, I think for schools, um, there's a, there's a, I guess like a PTA kind of thing, but it's uh, engaging the uh, uh, immigrant population called Proyecto Alcance. And I- Yes. I think they would be good. And then uh, a little bit on the early childhood side, uh, just you know, before they get into pre-K and K, I think uh, first steps reps would be good as well. Awesome, thanks Ro. That Trump. does bring up also, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure if you want to incorporate it or not, but even though St. Anne's doesn't have a school, they still do peas and carrots, right? I, I don't know if, the, I, I don't know how, how big that is. I mean, the other one that would be early childhood would be the Austin Children's Center. Yeah, I was going to, I was going to suggest that as well, because the, if we're looking at obviously the village and areas where, but now, are we looking at public systems? Because those are more like private sectors, sure, in a way. I mean, I think that those, even if those are private, those are, those are the, I think most people are sending their kids to pre-K are doing it through private programming unless OSNI provides universal pre-K, right? We do provide universal cool. pre-K. Uh, do you do it through some of these private entities? Um, there is actually, Austin Children's Center, there is a partnership with the Our school district for early childhood education. So I think they should be on the list. He's and Carrots is a Catholic school. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, and I don't, I don't know about Austin, and I do know that like traditionally in, in a lot of Latino communities, the church provides services through, you know, child, you know, programming that is for like low income individuals, even though it's not, you know, officially through public school programming. Uh, I don't know if that's the case here in Austin. I'm, I'm curious if maybe anybody else can chime in on that. I think it's predominantly done through Austin Children's Center. Okay, so peas and carrots is just private. Is it sort of private and more? No, it's just private. Affluent? 
private. It doesn't have a strong, I, I don't know that Peas and Carrots has any relationship to the school district whatsoever, um, but Ossing Children's Center has a strong relationship with the school district. The uh, only notable thing about Peas and Carrots is that it's uh, bilingual. Yes, that's right. true. So we, we'll add it to the list. I think it's good to probably be inclusive if we can, you know, of, of all of them. Uh, so again, the next one here is, is an economic development group. Um, you know, I guess same thing. Let's, let's take a couple of moments. Um, anything that we're missing uh, on, on economic development? I think, you know, one, one here, Karen, and, and this is going back to the more detailed list, is, is maybe getting some help um, identifying um, uh, representatives of, of the, the more underrepresented business community. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yes, like, go ahead, Jaime. Yeah, no, I was gonna say, I mean, you know, again, I, of course, I'm, I'm new to Austin, but I know that like, in, in Yonkers, we have a couple of merchants, they're Mexican, and they represent what's like an informal Mexican Chamber of Commerce. It's becoming more formal over the last year or so. But I'm, I'm curious if Austin has, you know, a couple of merchants that tend to be the the sort of the go between the, of the community members who are trying to get access to government uh, or trying to get access to you know the building departments, and so they tend to help sort of quarterback a lot of those conversations. Um, like here we have you know Tacos of Poblano, the owner of Tacos of Poblano in Yonkers, and 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 Austin, there might be like a really old you know store representing the Latino community that um, that people go to him or you know other businesses have sort of come through the ranks in, in his business and then started to open up their own restaurants or, or you know, various businesses. Is there anybody like that that you can think of in Austin um, that might play that role? Not that, no one that I, can, that I can think of. The only person, maybe if anything, would be Wilson from La Placita. Uh, he was uh, sort of one of the, the persons, maybe Roy, you can help me with some of the other stuff, but I don't, I don't think there's any particular business owner that I can recall. Uh, I've been mean, trying to get them together, but it's just been um, very difficult. What about Karma Market? Yeah, I would have said Ronald Martinez too from Karma. Um, what what was his bit. what sorry? was his last name? I'm I'm Mart sorry. Martinez. Martinez. Okay. Great okay. last name. <laughs> um, um, one other Go ahead, bro. So just, uh, I know that recently um, there was kind of another group that was started, you know, with Sing Sing Kill and Craven Jamaican and Ahib Long business, and Brothers. Uh, awesome That's the Alliance. Austin Business Alliance. Oh, so it's in there? Okay, perfect. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, the thing I was going to add, I see you have um, developers here and I was looking at the more detailed Excel sheet that you sent down. And one of the things that a lot of the developers you have here listed in common is that they have, so, at least a, a bunch of them have used the same architect for many projects that have come through the planning board. And there's a num number of other architects who um, appear pretty regularly and are involved in new, in, in new development or rehabilitating existing structures. And I think that, you know, I'm not sure exactly where you're going to go with the economic development uh, subcommittee, but they may also have an interesting perspective just on what it takes to move, you know, uh, development through the process. <laughs> I'm sure they do. By the way, I think that's a very good point, uh, particularly on the zoning when we get to that too. I, we, that would be good, Karen. I think that would be a good idea for us to so, be able to... So I know that's J.B. Hernandez. Who else? <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, J, uh, J.B. was the one that came to mind because I know like Pedro Silva, uh, he, Peter Chernoff, he's got projects for both of them going on right, right. now. Um, I could probably uh, maybe think about that and email you, Karen. Okay, great. And then I also thought it might be good to have some of the bigger developers, um, the ones who are representing um, uh, different properties um, that are, are under development or being considered for under the, the bigger properties like Hudson Step and, and those uh, I think I put those guys in there too. So 
um, it, it's probably good to have their perspective as well. Yeah. Aaron, we, we just need to be careful that we're not violating the code of ethics if we're putting them on a committee where they then also appear before a village board. Okay, so that would be my question then. Maybe there's other ways to engage them. We don't have to put them on the committee. You're like, you just have to let, Yeah, you know. I think you could hear from them, but you don't want to put them on the committee. Okay. Does that mean, Stuart, that um, not only, like I mentioned, architects, but actually the principals of these various developers should not be on the subcommittee either? Uh, I think it would extend to them as well because they're appearing through, through their architects, so it would work the same way. I mean, projects that have gone through the approval process, uh, even there you have to be concerned because like a Hudson Step, they're still having to go before the building department to get permits and they may have to come back for extensions. So you just have to be careful. That doesn't mean you don't want to hear from them, but I don't think you'd necessarily want them to actually be a member. Be on a subcommittee. So maybe we reach out to them individually. Um, I do want to like make sure that we're not overstating the role of the subcommittees, which are essentially to provide input and, and, and opinions, but they're not actually in, in the instance of the steering committee where they're making a vote um, or, or taking action to, to put what's going into that. So can, in, in light of that is labeling them as a subcommittee member, which I don't think really appears in anywhere but the, you know, the front page or something at some point of people reached out to. Is, is there any functional difference between a subcommittee and just a person you're getting input from? You just, you want to avoid the appearance of impropriety. Uh, if they are on something appointed by the village to something which, and they are also presenting applications to land use boards, you, you just have to be careful with it. That's all I'm saying. It, you just have to be careful. That, that's, that's my whole point. So, so well, maybe one, there's... Karen, yeah, well, I was just going to suggest one thing we do in a lot of other places, just have a focus group. It's right. Not group just a focus group meeting that's with fine. Others and that's what I was going to say so more of a stakeholder type me I, yeah, I mean we're, we're sort of getting into nuances of, of basically the same thing but a subcommittee can be more focused do more research stakeholders you could have a focus group where you're just asking some questions about development process in in, in the village right and it's not okay. an official in that it, they're a member of a subcommittee Aaron, I don't know if this is where we would put uh, the Austin microphone. Maybe. Maybe. Um, I. I don't. Yes. I think we could. For the underrepresented business community, I don't. I don't have any great answers for it, but I, I, it is an, an interesting group to uh, talk about because you have barber shops and cell phone repair stores and there's a ton of these little independent businesses that aren't part of any larger groups and one of the things that Karen has often spoken about is the way that over the course of the last decade those businesses have taken root and there isn't a clear reason why there's been a flourishing of these independent businesses here in Austin and so ensuring that there is some systematic way that we're looking at it, whether it's um, something that they have in common, like maybe they're all submitting for the same kind of paperwork uh, or approvals or licenses or whatever, that we have their information that way, or uh, they use the same point of service terminal or whatever. I, I'm, I'm not exactly sure, but I would want to make a particular effort to uh, get their input, which I recognize is difficult because a lot of them are at home right now and not working. And but even a, a round table with them, I think, would be would be good, just with them in particular. Yeah. So one of the things I'm hoping is through these groups. So like you have now you're getting people. So you're amongst people on, you know, whether it's the Chamber of Commerce, some of these, some of the, you do get a tiny bit of overlap on some of this stuff. And then through these, you know, these representatives, they can reach out a little bit deeper. And then once you bring people to the table, you might get others. And then again, keep in mind, we'll be doing other type of stakeholder discussions. We'll be doing larger workshops. And if we find that there is an area that we really want to drill deeper on, we'll be able to do that because the subcommittees will help 
drive that, you know, drive what resonates there as well. So hopefully we'll be able to do it. And then the building department may have some information too, just based on permits and things of that nature that have come through over the last couple of years. Okay, maybe we'll go on, Simon, to, uh, yeah. Okay, so the next one is, um, is parking and transportation. Um, any, any thoughts here, um, other, other folks that we should add? That's good. Uh, let me just ask, do you have, Karen, someone who deals with parking at, within the village? Um, yes, the police department, the finance department, the clerk's office, and Maddie Zahach is, is organizing that with, with Chief Sylvester to put together a little bit more of a seamless process. Okay. All so right. Maddie, I don't know if you want to speak to that at all. In terms of adding other groups onto this list or just generally speaking? Generally speaking, or if, you, if, if we miss somebody. No, I, I mean, I think, you know, we, we thought about this, you know, uh, last week. I, I think that this looks good from my perspective as far as parking is concerned. So the one thing I want to just um, remind everybody is the village has a, a parking study grant um, that we, we were awarded last year through the Consolidated Funding Application um, Grant Series. So this is something where um, we may be able to bear additional resources. Um, we do have a commitment of funding um, that could be, and the idea was to link it to the comprehensive plan. There, sorry, there are, Manny, go ahead if you have something. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, just had a quick question. Neighborhoods representatives on a T zone. How would that work? I, I don't know, but I was thinking that we could get the people who complain the most to the police department because um, one of the areas, to, to be honest, like we have parking issues with metering and just a, a weird array of, you know, permit parking, non-permit parking and everything, but we don't really, like, if you drive downtown, it's not like impossible to get a parking space the way it is in some communities, but increasingly in, in T-zones, especially where we have a lot of pre-existing non-conforming multifamily housing with no off-street parking. We're getting like, you know, a lot of off, you know, a lot more people are parking on streets that historically didn't have that much parking. So it, when you're looking at parking in terms of there's the economic development element of, of parking and making it easier and driving, you know, creating more opportunities, drawing more revenue and, you know, making it easier for businesses to sustain. But then there's a whole nother problem of overnight parking that, that we get a lot of complaints on. And I think that we know certain streets are worse than others. So we might be able to identify people um, from those areas. But I think if we're going to be doing that, my suggestion will be to look at the whole village as a whole instead of just doing the T-Zone because, um, and, and probably Stuart can correct me, uh, there are some areas within our municipality uh, that do not belong to a T zone. They're on an S, either 50 or 75, where we are seeing some very similar issues in regards to that. And, you know, um, how does that work? And not only that, but some of them have been going in front of the zoning board to try to obtain some variances and try to work with what, we, what, what they have. So I think we'll, I don't think it will be fair for us to just look at a T zone if that's the purpose of, of this, um, of the comp plan itself. We can so definitely we, broaden that. Yeah, we have a map that, um, that was, I think, created by uh, Tracy Corbett, the previous planning director, and it, it highlighted all of the um, existing non-conforming lots in every, um, by parcel for the entire village. Um, and so it did reveal a lot of what you're talking about, how there's this, um, there's probably parking issues all over the place, but the, the existing non-conforming lot, which might be somewhat correlated with the parking problems, um, exists not just in the T-zone, but in a bunch of other areas. So maybe what we can try to do is, is, is go back and, and use that map as a framework just to kind of internally look and see if there's some correlation between that and parking issues and, and, and start reaching out to representatives from the, the areas and the zones that are affected by this specifically. Okay. Um, there are two thoughts I had. One is when I was on the downtown redevelopment working committee, 
there was one idea that kept coming up and there are a lot of people that were really enthusiastic about it. And this is something that apparently goes back years and years and there's different iterations of it, but this idea of restriping Route 9 um, to change traffic flows and things like that. And I, it's a state issue, but I think that that's, I found when I was on that committee, there were a lot of voices about that. So I don't, I'm not even sure who the point person is to include on that, but um, that was something that was, um, there was a lot of discussion generated about right. that. The other thing, um, because it's parking and transportation, if there's anything that we can include, I don't see anything here specifically directed at people who use public transportation. That's right. Yeah. Okay, good. So if we can figure out what's the right, um, you know, what are the right people to include there or, or the right groups. That's great, Jeff. Um, one thing, so Creighton Manning, and actually this may create like a little bit of a conflict too, so we may want to use them a different way. Creighton Manning did submit a proposal um, to Paul and I actually not too long ago. Um, they've been looking at the Route 9 issue and then we were, we were debating on, on how we would work that and then we had the parking study and the comp plan, but we wanted to sort of marry that all and in, in, since we have the parking study money too, but then um, uh, the virus hit and we, we really couldn't set up the meetings that we needed to with the DOT. So that could definitely still be on the table and, and Creighton Manning's done some um, spec work on that. Um, whether we would engage them or not may make it, um, you know, to Stuart's point earlier, we may or may not want them on a subcommittee, but they're right here in Austin um, and they've, they've done a lot of thought on that and it is really um, a good idea. So um, we can see how we can, but that's who we've been talking to um, about that and they, they do have some definitive ideas, so. Yeah, normally, uh, Jeff, we would also, um, where you've got a state road, I mean, very important one in, in uh, you know, Route 9. We would, sometimes as we develop the uh, transportation chapter, we get a lot of uh, material, a lot of data from DOT. Uh, you know, um, average annual daily traffic, which they'll have for Route 9 crashes, that type of thing. And we also, sometimes in getting that data, can get a chance to go over things with them. It's Region 3 up in, you know, up in Poughkeepsie. So we can get some uh, feedback, but also it'd be very helpful if Creighton Manning is, is uh, involved if we just meet with them. Uh, it'd be good. Great. Uh, so the next one uh, is on housing. Um, sort of a mix here of uh, um, uh, different different types of groups, affordable housing groups, um, property owners, homeowners associations, and so on. And, and anything else we're missing here? I will make the same comment in regards to the neighborhood representatives, the T zone. I think we should be looking at the whole overall itself. I I don't. You know, there's, okay. there's a lot of non-conforming sites, even with our single family zones area as well. Um, I, you know, the T zone is not the only issue that we're having right now in our community. Okay. Good point. Okay. What is the Austin Housing Authority? Section eight. Thank you. George, I think it's a, I, actually, I think it's not the house, I think it's the housing voucher program. Correct, that's why I was confused. Yeah, no, the, so it's not really the Austin Housing Authority, it's a housing voucher program. That was my mistake. So, so housing I, voucher, so, yeah. I'm guessing this is count, uh, already under condo or homeowners associations, but just all the different co-ops that we have. Okay. Yeah, I, I think maybe one thing I would mention here is, and I know it's, it seems to be somewhat represented here. Uh, not really. I mean, there, there's nothing for renters specifically as it relates to housing. It doesn't seem like there's anybody who is listed here as specifically a renter. And 50% of the housing units are rental units. But we, we, we have representatives of landlords, we have representatives of owners and uh, multifamily owners, but we don't have any representatives of anybody except for maybe the landlord tenant committee. 
um, that has renters, which represents, again, 50% of the... So, Sheila, maybe that's something you could help with um, because of your work with CBH? I do rent. Yeah, because I right. do rent. Yeah. Um, yeah Sheila would... does a lot of tenant organizing. Great. Yeah. What about some realtors? Is that... Uh, you know, a realtor would be a good idea, I think, if there's uh, one, one or two. Uh, I'm not sure they have to be on, on the subcommittee, but it would be good, good to meet with them or if you want someone on the subcommittee. We usually find a lot of information about, you know, if we can identify a good realtor. Yeah. I might suggest um, some of the folks who are on the town's board of assessment review for that. Okay. The town board of yeah, the, the Board of Assessment Review. So the, oh, okay. they, they look at all the, the housing grievances that, that come in each year. So those, those are, okay. I think, four realtors. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, that'd be good. That'd be good. Okay, so the next, this is a, a bit of a longer list, but um, on community services. Uh, and w one thing, uh, as everyone's skimming over this, uh, I think the other important thing here, um, this is important through all of these, but um, in particular, um, this group of organizations, I think is, is going to be helpful um, in, in sort of working on getting the word out about the online outreach and making sure that people are involved, helping us um, um, you know, find the right way to, uh, to make contact with, um, uh, with, uh, with representative uh, uh, groups in, in, in Austin especially as we're doing a lot of outreach online. Um, good question, I guess. Uh, should we be including any of the religions um, institutes here within our community? So I know there's a lot of different churches that do a lot of community for services for our community. So um, the Briarcliff Ossing Ministerial Association, for the most part, not everything. There's a couple of churches that we have to go beyond with. Um, but that's one way to get, you know, that would be the key ones are doing like Trinity and um, Star of Bethlehem and, and First Pres. And um, um, I think there's some um, Hispanic churches that fall outside of that, but we can get to them through that. So yeah. that was sort of the one stop shopping place for, for faith based communities. And then, yes, and then does a lot of stuff for. for right. For, they would be part of BOMA. So okay. we can, we can. You know, that was just to keep the list from going off the page. So. Okay. <laughs> One question that I have is, um, would these be the subcommittees? And uh, if so, what about groups that, uh, where they maybe overlap? So like Mike Risco is on a couple of times and uh, other groups that are on more than one. Um, what are your thoughts there? Uh, Taryn, I don't know what your thought, I, I was just uh, reflecting on uh, the committee I, or the people I saw, Kevin Dworka list and then Pace list and outreach. There was overlap. Yeah. We don't so you, I, mean. I think that in some cases you may want people to do, you know, it, it sort of depends. If they're representative of organizations, so you have John Seltzman from who runs Down to Earth Markets. You have other people who work for him that maybe can be on the community service side. John can be on the economic development side because he also sits at the downtown development fund. Like there, you know, so I think sometimes you do want overlap. And then I think sometimes you want um, to get a different perspective. So, you know, if you're talking about housing, you're gonna really want IFCA on the housing side, but there's a community service side that, that they may, you know, so I, I think that's okay. We've done that before with other stakeholders and sometimes it's, you get different representatives of the same organization sort of dividing up on the committees. Yep, okay. Good. Great. Uh, so the, and then this group is, is focused down on, on the waterfront. This is, um, you know, one of, the, one of the key chapters is, is thinking about what is the, the, the sort of future of the waterfront area. So um, again, a good, a good mix here between um, cultural organizations and um, developer on here. So we might want to think about that. Nonprofits like Riverkeeper, 
And then a lot of the water dependent use is down the waterfront as well. So there's a there's a lot of waterfront north of the um, of the boats, the boat yards, and so I mean it's mentioned here that you want to talk to commercial property owners and developers. Um, I, I really would be kind of interested in making sure that that we're talking to those people that are north of the boat yards and really kind of getting out to them as well, because uh, that that is a huge space. Obviously, there's some controversy around the branch with Bill Factory, but we just want to make sure that we're, you know, looping them into the conversation. Um, yeah. We're talking about the waterfront. Hi, I mean, we did a little bit more work over the weekend on fleshing out that list. So I think I have the comprehensive list of every business. And then I think we reached out to most of them when we were doing the uh, Cornell adaptive study too. So we can flesh that out. Absolutely. Right. Right. Karen, is there any value to including uh, Department of Corrections for Sing Sing and uh, the county for the water treatment? Only because even though we yes. don't own that property, they are, and Metro North for that matter. Because Metro North is on there, but yes, oh, I'm sorry. the county, the county uh, right, wastewater and um, Sing Sing prison proper, yes. Right, okay. Okay, absolutely. Thank you, Stuart. Okay, then infrastructure and municipal services. Um, a, a lot of uh, groups that we would uh, we would typically talk to anyway um, as as representatives of the village. Um, DPW, police, uh, and fire, uh, building and planning, and so on. Should we have B line on there? Um, the B line we would normally put under transportation, but. Um, I think we should talk to the, you know, the B line. I, okay. I would put them under more under transportation. If, if mm -hmm. yeah. We mentioned that we didn't have um, the busing under there. So yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Quick question, Karen. So Phelps is here, but I don't see open door here. Am I missing that? And if um, open, why is uh, Phelps in here? Um, we could, uh, Open Door was on the community services, but they could definitely play a role here too. Could, could you explain the reason why Phelps is in here, is here though, as a municipal service? Um, it's our closest hospital. So in terms of infrastructure and municipal services, yeah. it, it's okay. our closest hospital, even though it's obviously not in the village. Okay. But we could, uh, you know, infrastructure does, and if we're putting, um, you know, a sharper point on the um, health elements to open door does play a pretty valuable um, sort of health infrastructure and municipal service too. So we, you know, again, there is some, a lot of, a lot of organizations play different roles. Okay, thank you. No problem. Okay, long list here for cultural and, uh, and historic. Um, look at this list as well. I think in, this is a tricky one because um, it, it's hard to include everyone. There, there might be you know, a, a dozen other uh, cultural organizations that, um, that we can include. So we, we don't want to leave anyone critical off, but um, it might be a tough one to, to have a you know, a subcommittee meeting with, with absolutely everyone involved. So, um, some some of these groups are on other lists too. So we may not need to get them all on one. You know, because a lot of them, a lot of these organizations, again, are involved in community services and things like that too. Yeah. Okay. Any comments on on cultural and historic? What is Sparta Jug Tavern? Um, Sparta's, uh, is the Jug Tavern is a historic building in Austin, and Sparta is one of the, uh, it's the oldest area in Austin where sort of Austin was founded. Um, that's at the south end of Spring Street. Um, 
kind of behind Arcadian Shopping Center. So the, uh, the Jug Tavern. Is that a bar? What, is that a bar? Um, it, it was, but it's, now it's not. <laughs> I like that. I like that. <laughs> OK, environmental organizations. Um, yeah, do we need to add odor bomb to that? Okay, is uh, is Audubon uh, they they're active in Austin? No idea. Okay. Uh, not that I'm aware, but they might be. Okay. Any other questions here? There is the uh, there's that there's that large park there that who owns that park? Is that a state park or is that a county park or is that a Village Park. You mean Crawbucky? Crawbucky. Yeah, that's Village. Okay. That's us. So do we do we um do we need somebody from the Parks Department to be involved in that conversation? Uh, Is that uh, yeah, somebody shouldn't from Parks should be involved in this. Yes. Yeah. And we had them listed on uh, one of, one of the other charts. Here's an overlap, which would be good. Yeah. There's, there's also any number of organizations that work, which I didn't list here, but that work regionally um, on, environmental, on, on environmental issues. So um, I feel like we've met with all of them over the last several months. So um, Maddie, may, maybe you and I can go through that list too. Um, they just tend to work, they're just more regional. Yeah. Being you know, because like, we don't have like the Greenway. Um, yeah. The, the Greenway people and then the, um, well, I, like sustainable uh, Westchester and, and yes, exactly. Who energize, exactly. solarize, all that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, and this is to circle back to uh, something that we've talked about a couple of times already, but it's just to reinforce the importance for us of um, working through these, these subcommittee groups. It's, um, we, we don't always make contact with, with such an extensive list of, of different local organizations like this. Um, and I think it's going to be very helpful for us, um, good as part of a general planning process, but especially now um, to make sure that, um, that we are, we're making contact with a lot of these groups and we can lean on them uh, uh, to help us, um, uh, to help us reach, reach out to the people in the community um, the last item here, I think this has come up a, a couple of times, but that if there's, if there's anyone who's not on one of these lists, maybe they don't fit into one of the categories or maybe we just, um, we just don't make contact with them in time, doesn't mean we don't want to hear from them. So um, let us know along the way if you hear from other, other groups who, who want to be involved and, and um, there's, there, there are other ways um, that, we can, uh, that we can hear from, from uh, different stakeholders and make sure that we're getting are getting the right input that we need. Do folks know, are all the senior communities in the town or uh, other municipalities not in the village? What do you mean by senior communities? Like, uh, I don't remember that. Like Mary Knoll is in, in the town. Okay. Um, and then we talked about Atria. Um, there's one in Brycliffe Manor, but there's also one in the village. Marion-Dale, um, Maple House, uh, Bethel has has a assisted living as well as a nursing home is that sort of what you mean yeah like that yeah um i think we had uh the the senior housing um under the housing bullet um but if you feel mm -hmm. that should also be accounted for elsewhere no 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 i just missed it oh okay yeah okay thanks mm -hmm. right um then the transportation can i go back there for a minute not so much to the slide but there are a lot of people walking in this village. School kids are walking. Um, is there any res representation for pedestrians and also for cyclists? Well, one thing we will do in the transportation chapter is, is try to go through some basic data on uh, what we can get on both bicycle. Uh, you know, Westchester County has a bicycle plan if the, if the village uh, has one and also on sidewalks um, where they are, for instance, mm -hmm. take of them, that type of thing. And hopefully that will then lead to uh, an analysis of, do you need more? Um, are they, you know, should they be extended? Um, that type of issue. Okay. 
one thing that I like to do, and this is just a, this is just me, a, a, a sort of technique that, that I, I sort of employ with some of our comprehensive plans is I'll, I'll try to come up over the summertime with my bike and um, Austin's small enough that I could probably bike most of the village um, and get a feel for, you know, where, where people might want to go and where and other places where they might not want to go and how we can bridge this gap. So um, that's, that's part of, part of uh, our process in a way. So. Yeah, be honest, Simon. Biking. You're just trying to show off your biking skills and your and your mean cat. <laughs> you know, we understand. <laughs> we, we got it. Um, and we are quietly walking all the streets of Austin. Yes. Perfect. Good. Good. Um, Get okay. ready for calls. <laughs> Omar, you can show them where all the best biking is. Right, you've been up and down every hill. <laughs> It's true. I'm, I'm like the only cyclist because very consistent <laughs> cyclist right here. But I think I, I appreciate you bringing it up because uh, it, it's a we're, we're small but mighty. Okay. Well, it's community so engagement good. update, Simon. Yeah. Um, community engagement. So the, the um, one thing that we talked about with, with Jaime and Karen um, a couple of days ago is um, we, we've been talking about briefing um, the trustees um, on April 29th, but what this has sort of morphed into, um, which we're, we're sort of excited about, is more of a, a virtual village hall, where we might do a brief presentation, but, uh, uh, but Karen and Jaime, I think, I think the idea was actually to open it up to, to sort of a Q&A, let people, um, you know, whether it's um, typing in a question into the Zoom um, interface or, or speaking, but having a way for people to, to sort of start commenting and, and, and getting involved in, in the process. Yeah, our thought process was that um, this would be an interesting way to do the touch, uh, touch base points with the, you know, typically this presentation would be done during a work session. Um, and, and sometimes that may be appropriate, um, but a work session doesn't give the uh, public time to comment and typically a legislative session doesn't always allow for, um, you know, Q&A either. That's more public comment. So um, this, uh, this way we can have people, you know, ask about the process, what it means. We can help demystify it a bit and hopefully get more people involved. Um, so we are going to promote that and, um, you know, make sure that we can, we can have, uh, you know, I think we'll get some participation or our, our uh, online capacity to get information out has, has been expanding um, because we've been employing better te techniques, but also I think because more people are sort of living online these days, so. So, so that's coming up, the, um, the plan name survey. Um, uh, we have some proposed dates for that to be open. But we'll talk about that a little bit more in the next slide uh, where we've got, um, got a list of potential names there. Um, we're coordinating with, um, with Jaime and, and Jamie on, on making sure that we're getting regular posts up on the village's Facebook account. Um, social media, um, I'll talk about it a little bit more in detail. We've got a quick video uh, on a couple of slides and the interactive map will come up uh, a little bit later on. These, these timelines, these dates are, um, you know, it's, we're sort of putting it out there. Is, is May to June the right amount of time for <coughs> this, this sort of visioning activity? Um, you know, it's, we, we, we can continue to, to, to discuss that. Um, we think it's worth having it up for at least a couple of months, but if, if um, we're getting a lot of feedback and we want to we want to keep that going for longer, that's, that's fine too. It can overlap with the interactive map so we can, uh, we can be flexible about that as we. Simon, one, one point, um, that meeting on the 29th is going to start at seven o'clock, not 7.30. All right, thank you. Oh, sorry, sorry about that. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, so here um, we, we, we've been working with, um, with uh, this company, Social Pinpoint, on this platform. Um, I hope this video works with the sound and everything, but um, they, they sent us this, um, just a quick tutorial on how this platform works. Um, this is an example from another community, um, right? So this is not, um, you, know, it's, you know, we'll have a, our own logo up here. The, the content and the questions are going to be a little bit different. Um, but you can see how this starts to fill in where all these different comments, um, you know, sort of fill up the page. People can click on, click on them and respond. They can like or dislike uh, the, the comments, or we can disable those features if, 
we don't want to use those. But um, let me play this, and um, uh, and then we can we can talk about it a little bit more uh, in a, in a minute or so. Oops. on an ideas ball, I would read um, this question, which is going to tell me what kind of feedback the um, consultation is looking for. And then I would just select between these three set categories um, as far as what type of feedback I would want to leave. I want to delete feedback related to streets. I would click here and this comment box would pop up. I would read through any instructions or thought provoking questions and then I could add my comment directly into this comment box. Um, and then I could choose to fill out any of the optional fields. And then, of course, add any required fields. And then once I clicked share, my idea would go directly to the ideas wall. Um, as far as when it goes to the wall, would just depend on when the admin decided to let it go public or not. So you can see there, it's a, it's a very simple interface um, to, get, um, to get an idea up here. And we, we, we have some flexibility in terms of what um, fields are required. Right, so if we want to make it um, required for someone to put, a, put an email address um, in their name, we can do that. Um, if we don't want to require that, we don't have to. Um, people can add photos. You can see some examples of photos down here. Um, so, um, so that's that's sort of a quick tutorial on on how people will use this uh, this tool. Um, any any questions about this? No, I mean, but I see it is a New Zealand city uh, council example you have here, yes. Palmerston North. Yeah. So the, yeah. The, the company is actually based in Australia, but they've got uh, they have I see. in in the U.S. as well. I see. Started. Yeah. I, so I I would I would say that you know similar to the conversation we had about the comment section on the website before, I think it's really important to ensure that we know the um, the location that these people are representing, whether it's um, village residents that live here or village property owners that own property here or village business owners who own businesses here, or if they are none of those three and trying to provide comments that guide the discussion. Um, because yeah. there, I'm sure will be plenty of people who are um, OSME, you know, school district residents but are not village residents and are not in town residents are not business owners are not property owners and therefore their opinion should be treated, you know, uh, as such. Thank, thank you. Um, I mean, actually, I was going to ask you the same question because we yeah. want to make sure we're hearing from our community uh, and obviously not to disregard what other people either work here uh, or have businesses here or just come here to visit, you know, and, and how does that work? My last question on, on this one is translation. How does that translate um, into the language? It's a great question. So, um, the, so the, 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 um, the platform includes uh, a Google Translate widget so that you can view all of these comments either in English or in Spanish, right? Okay. So even if someone enters their comment in English, um, someone could could sort of tab over to the to the Spanish translation and it translates automatically. Google Translate is not perfect, um, but it allows us to um, you know to for all the content to be viewed um, in in multiple languages um, without without someone having to uh, to sort of manually translate um, all the comments. Okay. That's great. Thank you. Right. Okay. Anything else on uh, on social pinpoint? Okay, so um, the plan name survey, um, we talked about this um, a little bit um, at the last meeting. Uh, we got a list um, primarily just during that meeting from, from all of you of um, I think a couple of dozen um, ideas. Um, we took a first pass um, at um, you know, eight or so that, um, that, that we liked the best. Um, of course, if we missed one that, that you all want to want to resurrect, um, we could bring it back here. But um, what we were hoping was that we could put a survey on the website that was more more focused than than these eight. So what we wanted to try to do now is, um, is see if we could get consensus on on maybe three or four that um, that you all like that you'd be okay with um, if the public picked it. Um, um, but then, then sort of puts it in in, in the public's hands to uh, uh, to pick which which one they like the best. A any initial thoughts here? 
I'll kick it off. I'll say that the one I'm putting most of my chips in for Nuestro Futuro or Nuestro Austin, I would say Nuestro Futuro. Um, I think a Spanish language name would send a huge signal and would be amazingly impactful. So I'm going to uh, really be advocating for that. I think the Austin strategic plan is descriptive enough for what this is and Austin 2030 uh, as my number three, uh, but it echoes what the county is doing. And so it will kind of copycats, but also it's descriptive. Those would be my three, but number one, Nuestro Futuro. And two was Austin 2030. Two is uh, the Austin strategic plan, and then Austin three strategic Austin plan. Okay, right. And what was your third again? Austining twenty thirty. See what I did there? <laughs> okay. All right. Anyone else? Uh, other other ideas here that that you all like? Um, I don't know. There's one that's not on the list, but um, uh, Austining resilience plan. Yeah, so I, I would um I would encourage every everyone who's on every um, steering committee member that is on right now really needs to weigh in on this. Otherwise, um, we're 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 not going to have real input. So we've gotten one response I think from Melissa Banta, um, and I'll forward that along. But for Sheila, Jeff, um, you know Manny, I think it really is important that you weigh in on this. Because uh, this is going to be the brand that we have to stick with for the next 10 years in regards to like the plan that has been set forth. So it's going to get mentioned repeatedly. And if it has a terrible name, they're going to be like, oh, my God, why did you name it that? So I, I like the first two. I like things that sort of um, are like future looking. And I guess uh, Nuestro Futuro is also forward looking. So um, but I like uh, I think Austin forward, Austin 2030. Things that look, a, I like the kind of forward. Uh, Austin forward. I think that that plan name has already been taken. Yeah, uh, Jeff, um, you know, I, I don't know if you were involved in this at all, but I know in the town last year, they had the three ballot initiatives um, that they were trying to uh, sort of uh, encourage consolidation of, of departments. And that plan was called uh, Project Forward. Um, so I know that that left okay. uh, not a nice taste in some folks' mouths. So I shared that with uh, I mean, Karen right. earlier today is a consideration. So that's fine. Uh, we could cross that off. But the one other thing that that brings to mind is that if we call something Austin 2030 or Austin anything, we're not distinguishing ourselves as the village. Um, so I don't know if that's something that like people want to brainstorm right now that like we could include like village of Austin plan or some, something to distinguish us because um, one of the things that is al always happens is people confuse the town with the village or different, you know, different initiatives. And is this really something that affects me? So, well, on some of these, like Austin 2030, you could say Austin Village 2030. You could put the word village in. Omar, could you change your your choice? And I'm I'm not going to pronounce it properly. Um, to being our village in Spanish instead of. Nuestro Austin. So like Nuestro Pueblo? Right. It's just keep in mind, Pueblo is not the right translation for the village. Yeah, because it, it doesn't translate exactly. Yeah. It, it does. Oh, okay. Right. And who, who right. Know what the hell that is? That's <laughs> Although, if you do say it in Spanish, it will distinguish. So that might be all you need. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But that I'm, I'm telling you, I'm, I'll, I'll, yeah. That, that's 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 a no for me. That's a no for me. Right. <laughs> hard pass, right? It's a hard pass. Hard pass. Hard pass. I would also say that I don't think that the title is where you need to distinguish town and village. I think that you do. You, you could do colon and then a subtitle you could do i don't know but like the reality is you know how many people don't know whether they live in the town or the village anyway like it's super confusing to begin with even if we name it one thing it's not going to necessarily clear it up uh, i would i would aim for simplicity beauty that's what i'm aiming for and spanish that's what i'm aiming for you know i i would i oh, sorry go ahead manny Could i oh sorry go ahead sorry. I, I will go with uh the first one austin 20, 30. 
Oh, <laughs> I'll send him tomorrow. Actually, I like those. But we can always, I, I definitely would like to add Billage in there because, um, you know, we need to identify ourselves. We need to make sure that we are saying this is our village. Okay. You know, I, I, I do want to mention one thing. There was, I think there were originally like seven of these and there was an eighth one that I threw into the list at the end that is getting no attention. I know I don't have a vote. So, um, you know, this may be totally irrelevant, but, uh, you know, the many voices, one vision, uh, I think, you know, reflects the sort of the mosaic, uh, the demographic mosaic of, of the village. And it also is very forward thinking. It's talking about a vision. And I think that a lot of the goal in this comprehensive plan is to create a vision for the future. And so calling it 2030, Lasanine Forward, Nuestro Futuro, a lot of these are talking about future and vision. And, and, and one, vi you know, one vision also, I think, is also future thinking. So just to give it some, you know, second thought in, in the event that you're looking for a third one, that it got dropped off the list. Jaime, mean, I'm not a vote either, but I like that one best too. So I'm just so so for our two votes that don't count. Um, <laughs> yeah, Jaime, say that one again, just so we're all many voices, one vision. Yeah, ben, the last one. Yeah, okay. Uh, Omar, can I just ask a question of you? Um, I guess about twelve percent of the village or so is African American. Do you think using um, Nuestro Futuro would be would would those people feel a little bit left out or you know it's a is it inclusive or you know is it uh just a question to you what a great question i love that question so um first of all when you look at the logo for the village it says corporation of austining that doesn't say village of austining nobody's confused about that so let's okay so that's <laughs> that's just <laughs> a specific thing I have to say about that. In terms of the span, the reason that I like it so much is because it is a bold choice. I, I, yes, it's true that the African American population in Austin may, may feel left out as a result. That's a possibility. I would say a larger possibility is that the white community feels left out. Feels like, hold on, this is a a, a plan for like. Spanish Austining and like this is like this is the, we're losing what we're you know what I'm saying the the make America great again hats are going to come out in droves and that's what I want I want something that's going to get people interested exciting talking if it's like the boring Austining comprehensive plan of 23rd I'm already falling asleep as I'm talking about it but it, I it, it, having that conversation of like should it be in Spanish already that gets people excited and wanting to get into it. Um, it, it may not get everybody excited in a good way, though. And I think that, that you know, I, I, I think that it's important to represent um, a majority of the community and well represent them because that was the problem the last time around where we didn't represent. Um, but we do, if, if we really are going to be honest about our village and our country, alienation is an issue. And... If, if we um, want to make sure, and, and I'm not going to speak to this as somebody who has a, a big stake in this, but I think we do have people who may have other perspectives who are sitting, you know, in their Zoom chairs at home. So it is important that we hear from everybody. Well, I, I let me just say, I like that. that um, what was that? Because I don't have the list in front of me, and I saw the list. Um, what was that one that you said, many voices? Um, one vision. One vision, many voices. That represents everyone. That represents everyone. I like that. Yeah. And I just had to put that in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I well, like that's that. good. Yeah. Well, Jaime, you'll be happy with that. I got one Again, vote. no vote. <laughs> Can you mix one. it? Can you have many voices, una vision, something like that? So um, not for nothing, not for nothing. I think that like it, it should be mentioned now. This is a, an an important point to to go back to the last slide. Uh, part of the process of ensuring that there's engagement in the Latino community is that all of the information that's going to be getting published is going to be published simultaneously in English and in Spanish. So any one of these, all of these, are English and Spanish translatable. Even nuestro futuro would still be our future in English. And it would be somewhat obligatory to translate it for people who did not understand what that means. So regardless of, you know, I'll, I'll defer to, to 
you know, my superiors to make a decision about where we're going to go with that. But I would say that any name that is chosen is going to be done in English and Spanish. And, and, and that's, that's the same with, with many voices, one vision. So maybe this is my point then. (laughs) Yeah, no, Jaime's right. And we intend to translate Spanish. So this will be. So do we have a top two or, you know, three or four? I, I, I heard Austin strategic plan and Austin 2030. Um, many voices, one vision there, there's, there's, um, is there a consensus on, it would be nice to eliminate as Simon has one anyway, Austin forward. Are there others? Uh, oh, we- I didn't do that. Who, I don't know who did that. <laughs> Uh, oh, that, okay. You don't. <laughs> that was me. I was playing with that feature. I figured. Okay. <laughs> okay. Can can we eliminate Imagine Austining and a stronger, greener Austining? Because I think yeah. both of those have not been talked about at all. I'll say yes. There we go. We're down to five now. If we could pare this down, if we can cut at least one more, at least one more, that would be optimal for us. Although if we can't, we can live with five probably, but it's, uh... Was anybody really? Uh, the most uh, clinical uh, one is Austin's strategic plan. I think you should cross that out. <laughs> too prosaic, too, uh, okay. Yeah, too, too yeah. clinical. Omar, that was, your, that was your number two vote, man. Are you, are you willing to <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm willing to defend strategic it. plan I'm, is? I'm, I'm willing to defend it. So if, if we were to say <laughs> uh, it, five years from now, um, we're following through on a recommendation from the 2020 um, plan. What plan? The Austin strategic plan. Everybody knows what you're talking about. But if we're, following through, we're following through with the Austin tomorrow plan. What is that? Well, that's a, and you go into a five minute explanation of what it is instead of, uh, to me, that is the benefit of a uh, straightforward. Now that's not my number one. I know again, my number one is in Spanish, but uh, the, I think the benefit of a straightforward as opposed to you're going to keep Austin tomorrow. Who's advocating for that? Raise your hand. I see no. Yeah, I, so I, I will say this. I think that it's important to understand that this is a brand and not necessarily descriptive of what it is. So whatever we end up on, um, it will probably at some point very early on in the text say this is the comprehensive plan of the village of Austin. Well, um, so that's going to be the, in there really early, if, if not even just as a tagline. Um, so this is the brand. The brand is Austin 2030, Nuestro Futuro, the Austin Strategic Plan, Austin Tomorrow, Many Voices of it. It's a, it's, a, it's a brand more than it is anything no, else. That makes sense. One unfortunate thing is that there was a gentleman who ran for mayor – uh, a couple of years ago uh, with whom I share a name and his campaign was called One Austining. I thought that was actually great marketing. One Austin. That makes so much sense. That gets to the many voices, one vision, blah, blah, blah. I was like, that's so good. But that's out the window. We can't use that at all. But <laughs> worth mentioning anyway. Uh, what do you think? Uh, are it was you, a good name. Uh, I, I, just so that we make some progress, is, is going with five to uh, a survey okay? Or do you think it's, uh, uh, we should eliminate one more? Or? I, I, I really recommend getting it down to four. It's the Austin, if I'm the only one advocating for the Austin strategic plan, please take it off. It sounds like it's, it, it's me out here in the wind. If so, feel free to take it off. I mean, uh, the Austin strategic plan could be the thing that fo- – you could have any of these other names, semicolon, followed by the Austin strategic plan. Like that sh- could be the subtitle or the Austin comprehensive plan. By the way, I think that's a good point. Yeah. The that's other guy's a great I point. Like that. The other name the Austin. that I didn't, was, did any, was anybody really in favor of Austin tomorrow? I was. But we did take it out. Did, I mean, did I, Sheila I like, just say something? Somebody just said I something. I was saying I like the strategic, the Austin strategic plan. I like that too. Right. Have we heard from everybody? I feel like there's other people haven't haven't weighed in. So we are missing um, some people today. We're definitely missing some people today. Uh, so we don't have Rebecca Fahey today. We don't we don't have a bunch of uh, of our members which is part of why we're not getting any way in from anybody else. Did, did Ro and um, um, Melissa weigh in? Ro is not here. I think Ro had to get off. Oh, Ro got off. Okay, well, that explains that. 
And Melissa did weigh in. Melissa did oh, okay, weigh in. Okay, I'm sorry. You give me I'm two sorry. seconds. I'll actually um, I'll pull up what her items were on the list, but I think they're all still here. Um, okay. To be honest. So I apologize for not sending that to you in advance. That's okay. If they're all good names. Yeah. Um, so her her selections uh, were Osney twenty thirty, Osney forward, and Osney tomorrow. Those were her three selections. Okay. So she's got twenty thirty still in there, and Osney tomorrow is still in there. I, I, my sense is why don't we just go with five? Because it's okay. hard mm -hmm. to. I think so Jaime, I know you want to get it down, but um, it's, I maybe let people. People vote on it. Maybe let people. It's uh, and if you really like a plan, you know, lobby your people to go up there and vote. You know, share yeah. it. <laughs> right. Vote for this right. because if not, I'm not making you no tostones. <laughs> exactly. All right. Great. Shall we go? Okay. Well, we got a few other things to cover. If this is okay, then we narrow it to these five. That's great. Great. Okay. So let me clear. <laughs> Drawings. All right. Um, so um, the next thing that we were going to do here is, um, is sort of walk through the, um, the draft of the website. It's after nine. Uh, um, is everyone okay with that? Um, or it's certainly fine with us, but I want to make sure everyone's all right with. Yeah, I think if I could ask the committee, this is an important uh, thing. We really want to get the website up. So if you could bear with us for like I think we can conclude this, Simon, in 10 minutes, maybe, but I think it's important yeah. to get through the website. Yeah, I would move forward. Please do. Yeah. Great. Okay, so um, we sent this around today. I don't know if anyone had a chance to look at it. Uh, one thing that I'll just point out, um, just, just uh, sort of logistically is that there's you see that it says home over here and copy of home um the home page this one here is what's up now as a as sort of a, a folder um so obviously once this goes forward, the rest of this will be the duplication of these items here in the menu but um I, i'm just going to sort of quickly go through the the content um on on the home page here there's a new slider that we can use to um uh, to, to put different updates over the course uh, of the process. Um, this one right now goes to the About the Plan page. Um, the next one here um, has some text about the, that we wrote about, um, as I said before, on the planning process um, in the midst of uh, COVID-19. The details of this are just down below. Um, so, so please uh, please read through this when you've given a chance. And then also on the on the slider up here is a link to take the survey um, on on the plan name. Um, again, as we go through the process, this slider can be used for for additional updates as we uh, as we have them. We're about the plan. Uh, first item is, uh, is background, um, sort of a high level. You know what what is this what is this plan about? What are some of the key goals? Um, I think we generally took these ideas from uh, from the RFP. But there's some information here about um, about you know sort of where we are relative to the to the, to the 2009 plan. Uh, the vision and goals uh, page. This this will be updated once we actually establish what the what the vision and the goals are. Um, we haven't done that yet, um, but there's a little bit of context about what what that process is for and how that helps um, us and also also the steering committee um, through the process. What those, what those items are for. Uh, the, the, the outline or the plan chapters are here. Um, these right now, if you click on them, it just enlarges the, um, the image. But as we have drafts of, of each of these sections, we can have these linked to um, another page that's got, um, you know, a draft chapter or some other information about, uh, about, each of these, um, about each of these sections as we go forward. And then uh, the timeline here. Um, very similar to the one that we show in the in the PowerPoint. Uh, so that's the about the plan tab. Uh, get involved again. This is a, um, a a menu item where we can we can update these throughout the process. So for example, right now we've got the plan survey here. 
but as as the um, ideas wall or other other interactive tools are um, uh, are are live, we can have we can have pages for them as well. Um, upcoming events right now, it's it's just the, the the committee meetings. But as we have again, as we have more uh, more events, um, we'll we'll put those on here. Uh, for example, I think um, Sylvia, I think we should get the uh, April twenty nine. Um, uh, virtual town hall in here. And now yes. that I, I look at this, um, mm -hmm. um, two items to um, uh, to to submit uh, user information. The stay informed uh, item here is just if someone wants to get emails um, about the process. This will um, and we're going to link this up with um, with the village uh, email list. Uh, and then the contact us item is if someone has a, you know they want to submit a contact uh, a comment um uh, so they'll they'll submit this here it'll go to Jaime. Jaime will look at the comments and uh and and pass those along to us um as as needed um one thing just to respond to something that came up a couple of times is that we we did want to ask um if people live or work in austin and one change here that i noticed um just now is that we should specify the village of austin here um so we can we can sort of ask that question and get people to let us know. Yeah, and Jaime, this will get at your point a little bit too. Yeah, it gives gives an address and do you live or work in uh, the village? Uh, and then and then the plan name survey. There's a there's just a bit of a placeholder in here now, but we'll we'll put that survey here um, so that people can um, people can submit their um, uh, their ideas. We'll 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 you know we've got some some overview text here. We'll let people know what the deadline is uh, and so on. Uh, so let's get involved. And then the team here is, um, is all of you uh, and, and more, right? It's, it's the steering committee on the board of trustees, uh, village staff. And then once we finalize the subcommittee uh, groups, we, we, uh, we thought that we could include um, at least the names of the organizations, if not the individual names. We'll talk about that, how much detail we want to show here. Um, but we want to highlight their their participation uh, as well, and then uh, uh, just two more items. Uh, so the documents um, uh, right now we've got links to prior planning studies that we've we've um, started reviewing, um, but also drafts of the of of the of the plan will go here as well. And then finally, we we find it very helpful to have an FAQ about a comprehensive plan uh, what is the plan uh, why why is the village doing this um, why do it now is a little bit more text about about planning uh, in the midst of, of COVID-19 um, how was the plan used how can we how can we get involved and so on who's, who, who's involved in the planning process so that's that's the framework of it um, if there are any any sort of big picture comments um, uh, let us know. Um, we can always edit text going forward if you if you catch something that that um, you think is incorrect. Um, but we want to we want to try to go live with this as soon as we can. Hey Simon, uh, yeah. could you show us how the? Uh, I thought this was really neat. The translation, the English tab versus Spanish up above. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So thank you, Jonathan. So the the um, the whole site is is translated. Um, we uh, we built this in in Wix and Wix has a nice um, interface with with translation where um, it uh, I think it also uses Google Translate. Um, you have to you have to edit it and, and so we've done that. Um, but um, but it, it sort of does a first pass automatically, uh, and then and then um, you know Christine goes through and and um, and double checks it and, and makes edits where uh, where necessary. But um, but but the site will be will be fully in, in both English and Spanish. I um, thank you. As uh, I actually had it, uh, some time early today to to go over that website. It's very nice setup. So I just had two quick questions. Um, well, one common, I guess, in, in regards to my name, if you guys could fix it instead of put a many, can you put Manuel instead, please? Is that oh, sort yeah. of like the official yeah. name? <laughs> yes, <laughs> <Sorry>. absolutely. <laughs> Yes. Um, uh, Manuel, would you like to be Manuel R. Quesada or just Manuel Quesada? Uh, yeah, you can put my middle name on it. That's fine. Yeah, you can put my middle initial in there. That's because that's sort of the official name. So I wouldn't want people to think that it was somebody else in there instead, just in case. Uh, the other one was, you know, I was uh, 
I like the colors, and this is more like a general, but, you know, is there any way that we can incorporate the village colors into here? If you go to our website, it was, um, it was a, it's a well-done process by Jamie at uh, the village um, office there where we incorporate the maroon color to be part of our website. And I'm not sure if it has to do that in here, um, you know, but I, when I was looking at this, I was like, maybe that's something more to tie back into what we are trying to accomplish. You know, what, what the bill is. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So I, I am going to own up to this particular piece. The reason that uh, when this was initially presented to us, it was all in maroon. And I will tell you that their directive from me was to add a lot of color. And the reason that I requested that was because I felt that the initial um, design with that maroon color strictly gave the impression of two things. Number one, it gave the impression that we're sort of a typical homogenous, you know, suburban Westchester County uh, municipality, like everywhere else, kind of mostly white, kind of things like that. And I felt that showing different colors also kind of provided this idea of that the, the village is a mosaic of demographics. Right. Um, and, and I also just felt that like, uh, it, it, it didn't feel very future looking either, right? So the, the idea is that you're creating a comprehensive plan that's gonna, um, when they go to this website, that is gonna evoke a sense of change and a sense of, 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 of movement forward. And so sticking with that old red color, that maroon, kind of gave the sense that you were just building in a plan that was sort of status quo. Well, I, I understand that, again. I may be wrong, so obviously it's not my decision here. My, my suggestion, again, will be something subtle that, that could be incorporated within that. We obviously have our logo, you know, it could be something maybe, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm looking at our website right now, and if you, if, obviously, if you can go to New Rochelle, they have their logo. If you go to Mount Vernon, they have, they change that, obviously, post is changing their, their background, how they do it. Peace Guild did it. Um, so more like a consistent team to me in a way. But again, that's just my opinion. So I'm not sure how the rest of the uh, members yeah. will feel about anything in the web. We could add it in as a, as a highlight for sure, as a, as a subtle tie back. I don't think that's a, I think that's a good idea. Yeah, Manny, I agree with you with uh, the need to have some sort of branding consistency. I think the, the maroon is indicative of Ossining as a village. I, I think it should be in there at least somewhat. I'll say what I really like about this website, that it's really rich in content. I think that's strong. I love that it's translated in Spanish as well. Um, I, I, I would, yeah, okay, yeah, I, I think that's great. Um, I, I love the fact that it has space to be built out so people have a sense of what's upcoming, that the, the chapters are gonna go in there and that kind of thing. I think all of that is good. And I love the fact that it talks about COVID-19 specifically, which I anticipate there will be uh, uh, small but consistent pushback from folks. Uh, about that. So I, I really like that. I will say that what um, areas for improvement, perhaps, um, I think that the colors are getting closer to what th this is to me just like a very plain looking website uh, is not particularly beautiful as a website. Uh, so I think having like, in terms of how I can make that comment actionable, when we come up with a name, I would love to come up with a logo and like a whole visual that goes along with it to, to make this uh, appealing as a thing. Um, and, uh, and having that, having that uh, on the website. The last thing I'll say is uh, what I wish uh, it had is more shareability. So social media buttons and kind of things like that to, um, to share pieces of this um, uh, more easily. Okay. Yeah, I just um, so I, I guess two two items to to respond to. So I I think that once we've got a name, I think we we do want to uh, create a, um, a a consistent logo around it around it. Um, so that's you know I, I I my sense is that that will probably replace um, you know Village of Austin and Comprehensive Plan update in the header. Um, so that that's that's the plan. So we'll do that once we've got the name. Um, the other is on shareability. Um, Sylvia and I um, let's uh, Sylvia let's talk about that and, and and see. You know, Wix certainly has the capability to do that. 
Um, and so we'll, we'll, we'll go through those features and, and um, figure out the best way to add that. I think it's a great idea. Good, good. Great. Anything else on the website? Um, is there anything that we should do? Um, you know, we can we can sort of tie in the the, the maroon um, and start start researching shareability. Is there anything that you all think we we absolutely need to do before um, before we publish this? In other words, our plan was our goal. I would say was you know after this committee meeting to try to get uh, up and going on a website. I, I think uh, that was one of uh, your objectives, Jaime. Uh, so yeah, I, I mean, I so the the website is going to aid in the the voting. So we're going to be yeah. placing voting stuff on there, a lo uh, along with the voting that's going to be taking place on social media and getting the message out there. But this is like a first blush. It, any of those changes that you just recommended can be made uh, fluidly, and unless there are not any major changes, like stop the presses kind of changes. If everybody's comfortable with it getting um, sort of published tonight and then we'll make those changes and quickly get them back to the committee to take a look at them um, to see how we're integrating the, the, the maroon and the logo um, and, and, and the other stuff. Is that okay? All right. Can, can All right. we take like, a, I mean, whatever it's worth, like a vote um, from all of the board members that we have left, all four of you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is that okay? I give a yeah. thumbs up. Thumbs up. Thank Frank, Manny, Manny's nodding yes. All right. Perfect. Looks like we're good. Great. I think if we're losing some people, I think this was the key thing to get through um, and, and be able to get this up on the website. Uh, do the four of you remaining, do you want to spend another few minutes or um, I just want to make sure we don't... Uh, I think we've accomplished what we wanted to, but we've got a couple of more items. We, if we might be able to go through this objectives quickly, Simon, and and just give up an overview because we can get through this. Also. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So um, what we wanted to start doing um, as we are starting to think about what um, you know, what some of the um, as we're learning about the different chapters and what some of the content might be, um, we are starting to look back at the 09 plan. Um, I don't know that we're going to get into this discussion right now, but this is something that we, we think can be an ongoing discussion as we start thinking about each of the chapters. Um, one of the attachments uh, that I sent out today um, extracts the objectives and strategies out of the 09 plan um, so, that, so that we can all sort of go, go through one by one and, and, and through those key recommendations and, and see um, it's, it's really these three questions at the bottom of the page here. Um, uh, it's it's how we want to evaluate um, that plan and how uh, what aspects of it are still relevant today. Um, a lot of people in the community spend a lot of time, put a lot of effort into it, so we don't want to um, we don't want to toss it aside. Um, where it's still relevant, we want to carry those ideas forward. However, some of the objectives and strategies from the 09 plan um, may have already been achieved, so we don't want to put them in the new plan, or they might, the priorities may have been, right. And so we want to think about them that way. Um, and then the third idea is, are there other ideas that are missing? So um, we are going to start uh, looking at those objectives and strategies from 09. Um, um, uh, village staff is as well, and, and we hope you do, you do too, so that when we start, um, you know, for example, next month when we talk about um, uh, the land use and zoning chapter, um, that might be one way that we frame that discussion. Here's what they did in 2009. What can we carry forward? What do we need to move on from? And, and what else might be... And I think with that, the final slide is the next slide. The major thing we wanted to say is we hope everybody's okay on May 19th for the next committee meeting. Uh, Karen had suggested to us that we do the, the, I think it's the third, that's the third, third Tuesday of the month. There were not other conflicting board meetings, so. That, that works for me. I have, right. I have just uh, two quick community questions. These are questions that have been presented to me from the community. Um, one is, uh, and they're related, one is about, um, we have a, a multi, uh, a mixed income, mixed use development that uh, we're working on in early stages. And folks wanted to know, when working on comprehensive plans, how do those 
uh, interact with large uh, development projects? Uh, did you find that there, I, I, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. I don't want to, go ahead, yeah. how, how do they interact? So maybe I can, I'd like to try to take a crack oh, at answering this question if I can, Frank. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, no, you so, go ahead. Go ahead. You know, I, I think that it, when you're dealing with large development projects, um, the interaction between the comprehensive plan um, and, you know, any sort of large projects that are taking place now um, is sort of uh, in a large part up to you. Uh, you can, of course, always do something like slow down projects to make time for the comprehensive plan. Um, and, it, you know, if you have a large project that is totally out of whack with the existing comprehensive plan that is, is a past plan, is a good plan, is a it's a relevant plan, then, then it, it matters because it's not in conformance with that comprehensive plan. But um, in general, the comprehensive plan and, and a large project, especially one that's going to take a while, can work side by side simultaneously to achieve uh, kind of the same goals. You know, big projects have to be in conformance with a well thought out plan. Um, and, and well thought out plans have to take into consideration that planning is taking place leading up to that comprehensive plan taking place and subsequent to the comprehensive plan taking place. Yeah, I would throw in one other thing, especially being on the planning board. Um, uh, at some point, you know, this plan that we're working on, it'll be presented to the board of trustees for a vote as to whether it'll be adopted. But uh, we still have the 2009 comprehensive plan. And, you know, if a project comes before the planning board, that's the uh, you know, most important planning document for us. So with any project, uh, you can look to, to plan and see if that project is in conform, you know, whatever, you know, is in question is in conformance with that. Um, Cause that is the, the binding planning document right now. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's, I think it's important to note that like there, there's, you know, every comprehensive plan has, some flexibility in terms of, you know, anticipating projects that are coming in the future. Um, so, you know, unless it's like a situation where you had defined an area as residential and you said, we're going to put an industrial, you know, smoke factory or something like, you know, like you're, 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 you may be talking about minor small margins of, of changes from what the comprehensive plan had thought about 10 years ago and what's being proposed now. It's important to, to understand that there are details specific to the project that will impact how it's going to be viewed. But I do. I also think it's really important to note that the decision to, to speed up or slow down a project of any type, um, you know, especially if it's coming in front of the board of trustees is the decision for the board of trustees to really make um, whether they want to speed it up or slow it down. It, it, that in that sense, it's a decision that you have to make. And so um, the, the, the kind of, intense review that's involved in a site specific project requires so much environmental review and so much consideration that um, you know that process is, is going to take as long as it would take to to do a comprehensive pl uh, plan so to, to wait for a project to happen after the comprehensive plan means that what's viable today may not necessarily be viable then and you're sort of starting from scratch it's not um, it's not really a good idea to do in general. I think in my experience working in municipalities, I, I don't think that's a great idea. My to second slow down a process. question. I appreciate the input. My second question, true or false. It is a best practice to have a moratorium on new construction during a comprehensive plan. False. I can answer false. that pretty, uh, pretty uh, directly. Those are my two questions. Thank you very much. Great. Hey, with that, thank you all very much. Uh, and I think that was our last slide. And um, your input was terrific tonight. And we'll try to go ahead with the website. And keep in mind May 19th. Thanks, everyone. Thank, thank you all. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.